Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast. Episode 193. It's all JSA, baby. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge on the Comic Forums, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim. Two JSA books sounded great. More of Flash Stargirl and the rest is awesome beyond debate. This episode, we are joined by special guest Donnie Salvo. He's just the best. So kick back and relax as we share some thoughts about Dr. Fate and the rest. So says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, and the Duke of You Know. Jim, this episode, <laughs> we are talking Justice Society of America and Blackest Night JSA. Plus, we talk a little bit more about JSA All-Stars. Even though we did that on 189B, we did that focused episode on JSA All-Stars. We get Donnie's thoughts on how he feels about the team split and what we're curious about. We also talk casually about Magog's solo book a little bit as well. So it's kind of an all-JSA episode. So I do recommend people, though, if you want to check out, and you didn't check it out, 189B, we have a very focused chat about JSA All-Stars, which is uh, kind of a great lead into this. Jim, the Raging Oscars is going to be coming up over the next two episodes, somewhere in there. We're going to do release, do it as a special release outside of our regular shows. So it all depends on how you and I are going to be able to fit in the recordings along with getting prepared for the other shows. We're also this month going to be finishing up Preacher. We broke Preacher into the little arcs that are contained within the hardcover specifically so we could, if we needed to put some spacing between the episodes, it would be logical episode breaks. So we are going to finish up that last arc in Preacher. And we also have coming up at the end of the month, we're going to do our special next book of the month, which is going to be JLA Avengers. So we've got a lot coming up over the next month. Next week's episode is going to be Blackest Night, and we're going to be joined again by Myron Rumsey. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. You can also hear us on Get Your Geek On Radio, getyourgeekonradio.com, an internet radio station committed to making geek chic. Jim, I want to remind everyone about the Hero Initiative. That's heroinitiative.org. And there's a handy-dandy link on ragingbullets.com for you to support that. Also want to remind everyone about comicsforsight.com, where you can still help out John Ostrander. And I think that's really fantastic that that's still up there and there's still opportunities for that. Our sponsors for this episode are dcbservice.com and instocktrades.com, where you can pick up Justice Society of America number 37, written by Bill Willingham, with art by Jesus Marino and Jesse Delperdang, with a cover by Jesus Marino. The war takes a turn for the worse for the JSA as the enemy fires up their super-powered negating darkness engine. But the terror rises when the team learns that the machine is powered by the black egg that used to be their colleague Obsidian. Regularly $2.99, 40% off, only $1.79. I'm excited for that issue because I'm anxious to see what's going on with Obsidian Yeah, and what, where they're going to go with that because I've loved the character from Manhunter and actually from Infinity Inc. years ago when he was in there, but it's, it's he's a character that I'm hoping out of this arc we get Obsidian back on the team. I'm guessing that's, gonna, that's what this is doing because I wouldn't think they'd... Uh do a big thing spotlight on him and then push him off to the side or kill him off. No, he's an interesting character, so I'd like to see yeah. especially more of the relationship with him and Dad. Coming in January, at the end of the month, our in-stock trades, Rage of the Month, was chosen by friend of the show, Kent Hare, JLA Avengers the Trade Paperback. That's 208 pages regularly, $19.99, 47% off, only ten fifty nine. And I want to thank in-stock trades for continuing to support us with that. Jim, I want to thank dcbservice.com and instocktrades.com for continuing to support the show. What kind of a podcast are we, pal? Well, Sean, we are a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth in the plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're reviewing on the show. So if we're going over something you haven't read, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Jim, I want to everyone about RagingBullets.com that has listener-produced columns, where's what not nows, DC release dates are up there, show news, and more. We're always looking for submissions and participation, so please send them to RagingBullets at gmail.com if you're interested in participating, and I'll definitely get back to you on those. My own column I'm going to be putting back up again this month. I took a little hiatus when we had the winter break, and I'm going to be doing more again this month with it. So that's kind of... My column's kind of my way of talking about things that fall a little bit outside the show or books that we don't get to on the show. I talk about gaming and movies and stuff like that in there as well. And we have so many wonderful columns out there and blogs that we're linked to from listeners in front of the shows. So uh, definitely check out some of the links and some of the columns and things that are available on our website. So we constantly try to support. Actually, if you've got anything, you're already doing a blog or something like that and you're a listener in front of the show and you want us to support it, please let me know and I'll put them up on the website. I like linking and doing cross-promotion and stuff like that. I think it's great for all of us, so... Very cool stuff. And again, that's ragingbullets at gmail.com for any of that. So, Jim, without further ado, let's join Donnie Salvo as we start our JSA discussions. Carter Hall, 
scientific genius from a far off world flies into action as Hawkman. Joining us for this segment is longtime friend of the show, Donnie Salvo from Reality Wasted. And Donnie, welcome to Raging Bullets. Hey, thank you guys. Donnie, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, first of all, we've been talking about doing this for quite some time, so I'm glad we finally got around to it. But you had sent in a, rec- um, a voicemail about JSA All-Stars and what you were kind of hoping for with the JSA series and, and kind of what some of your worries and concerns were, which were things that I shared, because I'm a huge JSA fan, and I'm with you that this is a team, they're Golden Age heroes, and there's something about you need that core group of them that kind of maintain that, they're kind of that symbol. They're kind of my go-to superhero team. They're the ones that are... They're, they're a team in the DC Universe, in my opinion, that like should epitomize what it means to be superheroes. So I loved All-Stars, but I wanted to make sure that the other, the regular JSA book had that feel. So it was funny when you had called in and said that. I'm like, oh, let's have Donnie on for this because it'd be fun to really discuss the JSA issue now that we have it to talk about how we're feeling about that team, because that's the one I think we were all looking to to say, great, this is what All-Stars is. We knew this was going to be kind of the squad that they're doing. What is this one going to be like? And I, I'm anxious to talk about the contrast, because I feel that there's a major contrast between the two books. Donnie, what did you think, just out of the start? Did, were you happy with this issue? Did it, um, did it take care of some of your worries? Are you still having questions, or where are you at? Well, in a, in a sense, it's still kind of a setup issue from the split. Um, and this issue has more of the legacy aspect than All Stars for me, the, the regular title. Because for me, if you take the legacy aspect away from the JSA, what do you have? You have the JLA, basically. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, exactly. There's, yeah. A, there's a core root to them. I think that's and, why. Well, oh, good. And like my biggest fear is just that like I don't want them to to split it, and then for uh, lack of a, a better comparison, I don't want the All Stars to turn into X Force of the DC Universe. Mm. Okay, you see what I mean? Because yeah. it just doesn't fit. It just wouldn't fit. You know? I mean, I know one one issue came out. Like I said, I'm going to give it a chance and whatnot. I'm on. I'm in for the haul. But you know, I'm not trashing it by any means. I thought the story and the art was fantastic, but. I just it's the direction that worries me. I think t- to me what I want to see from All Stars. I want to just start talking about All Stars seeing as we're kind of on this tangent right now. What I want to see from All Stars is McGaug, it makes sense with what they're doing. There was a there's been a split in this team that they've been teasing, not only in the main series, but also in the JSA versus Cobra yeah. mini series. You know, yeah, they've been teasing yeah. that there's, there's some tension. ideology differences going on amongst these JSA members. Mm-hmm. Longtime members were having issues. So it's I you know, it's you know, kind of just a natural flow from the one into the other. And it, there was I liked in the JSA versus Cobra how it was a different ideology between Power Girl and Mr. Terrific as well. Because I want Power Girl's really important to me. And that's like in All Stars, that's something and I agree with you, Donnie, it's it's the first issue out of the gate. That's something I think we're going to see more of in All-Stars, because I don't think that that stuff that we saw with Stargirl and Power Girl, how she specifically wanted Stargirl there, I think she wanted a veteran from the JSA. I think she wanted somebody who she knew she could rely on in Courtney, and somebody who the younger sect looked up to and could relate to in Courtney, because I think that Power Girl was realizing just what you're saying about Magog. And that's where it gets interesting for me, on that, on that squad. I wouldn't want to see that in both titles. I would be really disappointed if I saw that in both titles. But to me, that makes sense why you would do a separate team, because we've got this division, different of I- different ideologies. I think the, the team was way too huge as it was. I, th- I think it fit what Johns was doing in the beginning with the society aspect, but with a new creative team on there uh, and a new direction going on for it, I think the idea to split into two books makes sense. And you don't want the books to be the exact same book. But saying that... I'm with you in that I need a legacy aspect, and I think, to me, with the I think this division, the way it was divided, is not an accident. I mean, this team, we've got Mr. Terrific, Flash, Green Lantern, Liberty Bell, Wildcat, Mr. America, uh, Lightning, which is, you know, a newer character, but, den- you know, deep legacy as far as her family history, Dr. Fate, the new one, who, to me, just feels like he should be... On this team. Yeah. He, yeah. He definitely needs to be on this team for just... 
who he is and what he's he's not completely comfortable with being Dr. Fate yet. He's not fully even powered into what is Dr. Fate. So it kind of fits that they would have the old school, you know, JSA members taking him under the wing. That's how I took with the Lightning being on the team. They need the traditional classic building the next generation of heroes in her on this team. They also have Dr. Midnight and uh, the Magic 8-Ball we call Obsidian. <laughs> <laughs> The Onyx Egg. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of glad, though, right out of the starting gate of this issue, with this villain, that, you know, what they're going to with, obviously, with Mordru, we might as well just go and, and talk about that, um, that they were going back to something that was from the classic JSA series. Did you, Donnie, how much JSA have you read? I, that'd be kind of fun to talk about. What is, what is your background with JSA? Uh, I, on and off since All-Star Squadron and okay. Infinity, Inc., from, like, 1983. Yeah, so you and I are actually very similar then in our history with these characters. We, we've been long time. So I'm with you, the actual rich legacy aspect of it. And actually, it's funny. I'm, thinking, I'm hoping that this has the feel of the differences between All-Star Squadron and Infinity, Inc. But I need that team that feels like All-Star Squadron. Right, right. And like that was one of my favorite lines, actually, in, uh, in JSA All-Stars, is when our man just said, when they when they said let's call it infinity, he goes, "Nah, Ben, they're done that." That was one of my favorite lines in that book. Yeah, it, it, I, the team names they were rattling off and stuff like that. It was, I mean, it's it. There is an aspect to that team I'm really really enjoying that book. I liked out of the starting gate, and so, I like they brought um, the original our our man into it as kind I, of like the yeah original mentor kind of role. Even though he's just right now, he looks like the handyman. You know, I mean, I mean that in quotes, like he's not, you know, well, walking you know around what? with um, a broom and stuff. But in Starman, we saw that with Jack Knight's dad, Ted Knight, and I right, always right. liked that too—the nod that Dad's still around. Why wouldn't you use him as a resource? Because Dad has that rich experience in history, and I'm with you. That was a geek out moment for me that I thought they nailed. I was thinking, I I kind of looked at him like he's their version of Ma Hunkle. Is who? Ma I missed that. Uncle? Ma Yeah. Hunkle. You know how she's always hanging around with the JSA and all that? Yeah, I didn't get this. Oh, was, oh, yeah. okay, I got you. you know, so right. he's their version. He's the yeah. all-star version of it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so I guess I was the only one who no, even no. remotely thought I get what you, I, get, I get what you're saying. You know, I, I know what you mean, too. Yeah. yeah. Ma Hunkle, well, you know what? It's funny. I was, I was about ready to dispute you, but she does take on kind of like a parenting role yeah. and things like that for the team. It's probably, she's awesome because she's just like in the background. It, yeah. Or... Another, he could be, he's going to, I, you know, future stuff, I see him being used kind of like even, maybe even an Alfred type role, which is the same as, I think. As Ma Hunkle. Yeah, Ma Hunkle. It's that type of role yeah. is what I'm talking about. No, no, about. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I was, no, no, I'm actually good. I okay. was, I'm stop, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 uh, my hesitation's here because I'm more stopping <laughs> myself because initially I was like, I didn't see that at all. But initially you wanted to bash me in and now you're I like, don't know okay. about, <laughs> I don't know about that. I, you know, there's no violence intended here, but um, it, it is one of those things where I, I literally, at first I'm like, I don't see, I, I caught, right, when you said Ma Hunkle, I caught what you said right away, but I'm like sitting here, I'm like, really? Ma Hunkle with Rick Tyler? I don't know. Cause I, it took I guess, me a few minutes to figure out who that was. Cause, well, <laughs> I guess because I've read him so much as our man that I'm like, wow. I... No, but but not, I am I'm I'm I take it back. I'm warming up to the idea. You and here's actually... the thing. And once again, this is a differences of our usage of him. Right. I've only read one JSA classified where he was even had any hour man type powers, and it was specialized. It was focusing on the current hour man. He was in thing, and his dad was in the character. So mm-hmm. that's my only dealings with him with the dad as our man. So I have, once again, I see him as the older guy, you know, initially I was thinking, you know, Alfred type, and I'm like, well, you know, Ma Hunkles for the JSA, that's, and that's how I, you know, just, you know, pro- associated him, because I really don't see him in the superhero light. I see him as the dad of a superhero. You know, it's funny, the, the Infinity Inc. comparison to All-Star Squadron, after, after reading this issue, works a lot more for me. I'm I'm really curious to see where this is going because Doctor Fate for me that was the key to this issue. I was so anxious to see Doctor Fate and to finally you know I'm glad that he's on this team. He's not just making a cameo. You know that there's we're going to see a lot more from this character because I've always liked the concept and especially now it's a very different concept. Uh, Naboo's gone. There is nobody else in there. The previous Doctor Fate, um, you know, Hector Hall. 
he had the advantage of going in there and pulling from the memories of Kent Nelson and his wife, and being able to pull from Fate. You know, the character, the, the character that actually just was Fate. And actually, Mordru was in there as well. It was like kind of a smorgasbord. <laughs> but it's funny, Mordru, which I think is interesting in this arc, actually has more experience with the helmet than even Kent Nelson does, <laughs> the new one. So it, it's interesting that they would bring that character in, and I'm going to be curious to see what, with this new age of magic, what Dr. Fate's going to be like. But I've always been a fan of the Dr. Fate concept. There's a Brave and the Bold issue out right now. I don't know if you got, either of you guys read it, but it's Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, and Dr. Fate. It's the original Dr. Fate, Kent Nelson. And it takes place in the past and in present day. And I'm not going to spoil anything else other than that about it for any, if you guys have any interest in reading it, whatever. But it was, it was kind of cool to see what it was like for classic Dr. Fate to contrast it with this Dr. Fate. It's a good one-off issue, and that's for anybody hmm. out there who's remotely interested. It's the one that's um, done by Straczynski right now, and um, Jesus Saez, I think, is the name of the artist. Um, that is the ongoing artist. I'm, I'm more questioning my pronunciation of the name. But the artwork's really sharp, and it's, it's a good one-off. So if anybody's a Dr. Fate fan or, or a Hal Jordan fan, that's a good issue to pick up because it's really one, a one-off. Yeah, that is a good series. That that was a good issue, but it, that's a good series too. Since Straczynski took over, these yeah, nice little one and done stories. Flash and Blackhawk issue, I yeah. thought was really good. Um, Batman and the Geek, I that thought was, was that was great. It was just a bizarre, but it was great. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw that cover, I was just like, "Really, brother, the Geek? What? Yeah. <laughs> Are you serious?" <laughs> and it was cool. <laughs> it was. It was very good. But I love, like, the Flash issue, it made sense as far as why he was with the Blackhawks. The Dr. Fate issue, it made sense why Kent Nelson would be with Hal Jordan and how it worked with the past and present day. And I loved some of the morality. Did you read that issue? Um, which one? Dr. Fate and Hal no, Jordan. No, I have not read that one yet. It's on okay. my... Because I, I don't want to spoil it for you then. Well, you can. Well, I don't mind. Well, the one thing... I, I, do you don't mind if we go here? Go ahead. Because Donnie read it, so... Yeah, Donnie's read it. Rock and roll. I love the morality of it, because he... Dr. Fate's trapped in... Not trapped. He he left part of himself in Hal's ring in the past as kind of a thank you, and also as a chance to kind of see what he was like in his future. It, it's like if you had the power and the opportunity to leave it a part of yourself with somebody, so that way you could, like, pop in and see what your future's like, and then pop back and tell yourself... <laughs> He did that. Oh, nice. But he, because it was actually leaving part of himself and part of his essence and part of his power, it became a big morality thing because Hal's in trouble. His ring has given out its charge. He's been hurt. He does not have enough power to get himself back to Oa. This is his friend Kent Nelson, who he knows is dead. Ooh. So he's telling him to go back and warn himself about his death because maybe he can change it. He doesn't want to say goodbye to him twice. And Kent's like... Hal, I gotta help you. This is who I am. I'm a believer in fate. You're a believer in will to change things. I'm a believer in fate, and this is how things have been laid out. I was just like, that is so cool. Wow. I was like, yeah, it was. It was. So, I mean, he was in this big morality moment where he had to sit there and say to Hal, uh, you know. And Hal's like, but how do you know that leaving this power with me isn't what caused what happened to you? Like, maybe if you'd still had right. this power, yeah, maybe you would have lived all along. So it's it's just crazy. It was like a really cool moment to see two different heroes with two different philosophies that Kent was still willing to give up that part of himself and just say, you know what, it's more worth it to me to save you because this is who I am. I believe in fate. I believe this is why I was here. This is the right thing to do. This is who I am. And he, does, and he ends up saving Hal and giving him the power to send him back to Oa in spite of all that. And Hal was fighting it all along, and I liked that too because it fits Hal that Hal would say, no, don't do this for me. I can make it back on my own. I'll find a way. I'll make it through, and Kent wasn't going to stick for yeah. it. It was, it, was, it was just a very different kind of issue, and I think it's very cool. And the reason why I wanted to talk about I mean, I think for people that aren't reading, we haven't talked about Brave and the Bold much on the show, so I figured seeing as we went, I, I didn't plan to go on that tangent. But if, if anybody's not reading this book, like Donnie says, it's really good. It's a great book right now, and if you jumped off Brave and the Bold for any reason, don't worry about what issue number it's on. You know, it's a new writer, it's a new direction for the series. These are all done in one issues, so you can jump on at any point in time. Pick up some of these issues with Straczynski, though, because he's doing a great job with this book. It's really accessible. And, and this book is really to his strong point, because he can tell a very good one, two-issue story. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, it's it really is. I mean, because a lot of people, the biggest criticism you hear about Straczynski in the comic world is when he does a long run, he kind of gets lost. And it, you know what I mean? It, it, re, it actually reads um, very much like a, a single episode. I was a fan of his Battle right, right. 5 TV show, which I thought was absolutely tremendous. And there were issues, there were specific, I was going to say issues, there specific episodes of that where it was just, it was like what I'm talking about with this Brave and the Bold issue. They were just mind-blowing with the, the things they were making you think and, and the directions they were taking you in and the twists and turns. And that's something that I think shined, has been shining so far in his Brave and the Bold run. I think this is something where you're right, Donnie, this is, this is a great, he's, he's wrapping his head around comics in this particular it's, series, I think. And it does play to his strengths. Uh, and, and also, I love the fact of Brave and the Bold because they will put two characters together that you would never, ever, ever think would even see each other in the DC universe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is, the, um, Brave and the Bold was on my chopping block. And it wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't about not enjoying it. It was just, I had so many titles. I was like, you know, I could probably do without this one. I don't think it'll, you know, kill me, you know, not to have this. So I was getting ready to drop it, but I was like, oh, I'll, we're going to have a new creative team come on. Let, let's give it a shot. And, you know, right and as he, you know, as started taking over, I was like, okay, I'm really liking this book now. It's the one on the chopping block. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what's the difference for with it for me now is Brave and the Bold went from being a a title that I was stockpiling, you know, where I was kind of like, oh, you know, I, I want to read it, I'm interested, but it's okay if it goes two or three issues, you know, before I actually yeah. get to it, to becoming a title that I need to read every month. Yeah. You know, like, I'm excited to see what they're going to do, which is interesting because it's not in continuity. I mean, it technically is in the sense that the way this was crafted, you could see that this story happened in continuity. You could see that it, was, it happened with a present-day hell, and it happened with a hell in the past. And you can, you can plug it in yourself where you think it happened. So, you know, it, it went from the past. It, it could have taken place in the past. It could have taken place currently somehow. It works. Yeah, they're even billing it that way on the on the book. It's stories of the past, present, or future, right? Or something to that effect on the cover. But uh, Jim, I feel your pain because when they announced all those Bat books over the summer, yeah, <laughs> I ordered every single one of them, and I'm a Batman guy just like you, Sean. But I'm going, you know what? I'll order all of them. I'll take the hit on the wallet for the first couple of issues, and not all of them could possibly be good. And then <laughs> <laughs> they were. They were. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, dang you, DC, dang you. <laughs> now I get every single book, and I enjoy every single book, and I have no complaints except for the hit on the wallet. <laughs> well, you know what the thing is, though? Let, let's say financially, though, you sit there and say to yourself at some point, I've got to make a cut. I'd ra- personally myself, I'd rather, ma- I'd always rather make the cut because and and cut off titles that I'm enjoying because I'm just collecting a whole bunch of stuff that I really like, than having to say, okay, I'm reading stuff that's mediocre, and I'm having trouble deciding which mediocre title to cut. I'd right, always, right. I'd always rather err on that side and say, okay, you know, I got no choice financially, I've got to do this. But so this is a nice. I think it's a nice problem to have. <laughs> oh, exactly. Sure, sure. But as I'm looking through this one right now, and looking through this Mordrew sequence, what I liked was it wasn't just about focusing on Mordrew. We got to get kind of a flavor of Liberty Bell, for example, and and actually this Mister America, and we got to see. I, the cool part about this was we got to see that he's having a little bit of trouble. With fitting in on the team, yeah, it's adjustment. She is having a little trouble yeah. with where things are going. Everybody thinks that she and her husband have broken up. And you know what the funny part is? That was my big worry as a reader, and I love that they're playing it up so heavy in here. Yeah, I think that was a big fanboy worry, uh, period. And I think this is the writers having fun with it because it was mentioned in All Stars too. So. Yeah, but I love that she is so aggressively yeah. acting it out here, and <laughs> and you know she brings up the excellent point though. You know, we're just in different jobs, and, you know, that it's... Well, our man said that in that press interview sure he that did. they had. He's like, hey, we're like any other married couple. We just work at different locations. It's, you know, not a breakup. It's not an ending. And she even went a little bit farther into it in that, you know, the reason they went on separate teams is to keep the lines of communication open between the two teams. I like that, you know, mindset and that logic that they both would have that, you know, let's just keep things going. Let's make sure we still remain the JSA. 
you know, we remain one team, one unit. And I thought that was a cool idea that, you know, they would have that idea like we could be on other teams. We know our communication won't break down. So this way there's always going to be open communication between the two teams. I thought that was a good idea and mm-hmm. a good concept and good people to use that in. The advantage of the teams having different MOs, too, is when they do team up, there's going to be a tough dynamic because they are so drastically different. Because I, I do feel with this issue that we got the vibe right away that this team is operating very differently than Magog's squad this, I, concept. This is operating the classic JSA team. Right. Exactly. So I do think it'll be fun to see them team up um, and to see a much stronger team out of this group. Because I think we've, we've been seeing for months now the reason for the split, and we haven't seen that core legacy group that's really come together tightly, and we're going to see that out of this squad now because they have a chance to actually work together and get stronger. See, I think at the end of this issue, you know, in, in we're jumping oh, yeah. way ahead. No, that you know, the end of this issue, we saw the core JSA. That was a you know, for me, I would say that's a classic JSA moment. Just you know, the way they're all lined up, they were set up and ready to rock and roll. I thought that was just a cool way to end this book. You know, especially there's all this question in the air: what are we going to do? Who are we going to be? At the end of this first issue, we see that they are still. You know the JSA, and you know great leaders without anything next... in the way, though. Right. Without, without that roadblock, because I think Magog became a major roadblock. Yeah. For them. Well, I, I also like the, uh, you know, through <laughs> through the whole issue, you're like, oh my, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then they're just like, okay, so uh, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, I didn't see that coming when it did. Neither did I. That's why I was like, you know, hats off, Willingham. Yeah. Cause, cause, <laughs> you got cause, me. Because they had him. I, I loved we've, we've been following him as the narrator all the way through. And did you did you pick up that it was Mordrew? No. I, I got to uh, And this isn't like me. I, I actually caught because I loved that run. I've read that run like five or six times now. The John's run. And the Mordrew stories that he was referencing in here with the amulet and things like that, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Mordrew. And I love that. But here's, here's the thing, and, and the reason why I'm making the point here. The, the cool thing is, for readers who caught it, it's something for you there. For readers who didn't, or new readers, like yourself, Jim, you don't know who Mordrew, I'm guessing you had no, did you know who Mordrew was? After I did Wiki and Google, sure. But I'm saying <laughs> when you I first read this, I had no idea who this guy was. But his internal narrative brings us all on the same page. So yeah. all three of us, by the end of this issue, knew what his experiences were, that he has a link to Dr. Fate, that this isn't the first time that he's been in this position where he's been inside there on some <laughs> level. And that, that, to me, was kind of a cool thing about this and it was it was good storytelling for that reason yeah i like you know not even knowing who this was or anything the fact that he even made reference to it's very fitting that i should be inside my old uh, my old great adversaries you know you know for this uh rebirth type of deal where he was like saying now when he first jumped into dr fate he was saying this is you know this is you know poetic justice that i'm inside fate so right there i knew okay this is you know somebody that they had uh, thrown down with before, and fate probably kicked his butt. But he's also analyzing the situation and realizing this is a new fate. He has no defenses. He has n- basically this is really a newbie. He has no clue what he's doing, which is a new thing for Doctor Fate. Because typically, when a new person took over Doctor Fate, there was some form of mentoring going on from Naboo, you know, from Ken Nelson. From I mean, there was you know some form of contact. With the previous yeah. hosts, or the previous, you know, uh, I guess I guess you say hosts, I don't know what you want to call it. But I like that. I also love the personality change immediately. Because he took over, he didn't, he didn't instantly become, like, Kent Nelson. Because Kent Nelson came and he's, you know, really you know, nice in the beginning. He's saying things like, hey, what's with all the yelling? Are we under attack again? Big smile on his face and all that. You know, just a really <laughs> positive looking guy. Then this guy goes in and he's immediately cocky. And he's got this, like, stir... He's this, got that smirmy smirk on his yeah, face. Yeah, like, hey, I, uh, I know something and you don't know. <laughs> the thing I also liked is the, orig- the, the real Kent Nelson's carrying the helm. This guy has the helm floating behind him. Mm. Right, so, so you kind of got the idea that all of a sudden he's got a grasp on his powers. Or he this Dr. Fate learned a new trick in the past five minutes? Yeah. yeah. You know? And actually, you know what I love about that? I'm, I'm going to be 100% frank with you. I didn't notice that. 
I've read this through a couple times now, and I actually did not notice that there was that distinction, that it wasn't happening when uh, Kent Nelson was carrying it. He was just carrying it. You're right. Yeah. But what, what I like about that is that's another clue that explains why the JSA knew what was would have caught on to it. Yeah, not just some... the personality differences. Now you're seeing the helmet floating behind, which is something that would be different for this guy. Yeah. So there's little tiny things that he did that gave himself away. And I did right. like that they did make reference to some of his behaviors as he was going along. Like yeah. he was getting into arguments with them. He's not the most stealthy of individuals, is Mordru. Well, no, and it's, you know, you think about it, um, you go back to the classics uh, Star Trek episode where they were, you know, pretending it was the, the uh, mirror, um, the mirror universe episode where, you know, they went over and became the evil guys, you know, the, with the goatees and all that. The On the regular Star Trek side, they knew immediately that Evil Kirk and Evil Spock were the bad guys because they couldn't hide the fact that, you know, they couldn't act like the good guys. It's easier for a good guy to act like a villain than a villain act like, a, you know, a good guy. I love the doc, the um, discussion with Wildcat about the Nine Lives. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're from sitting, the they're Avenger around. JSA episode? Yeah, they're I mean, sh- issue? Yeah, they're sitting, around, they're sitting around trying to figure out how many lives he actually has left. And he's like, sitting there saying, what are you, dense? You've always got nine lives, as long as you don't use them up in one cycle. See, and that had me wondering, now this is the geeky in me, I'm like, okay, what is considered a cycle? <laughs> you know, you, I'm like, because <laughs> I'm like, that's kind of cool, I love that. I mean, another giveaway by Mordru right there, but still, I'm like, okay, I want to know what a cycle is, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff I actually think about on the way home or to work. I do, you know what I, I do, too. I think it's cool. I'm like, all right, that's got a little tiny geeky detail. And I love stuff like that because well, it, it adds something new to the mythos. And it was a throwaway thing. <laughs> Here's the yeah, if you didn't read the previous series, you probably wouldn't even know what he was talking about. No, but it was cool. Here's the funny but, thing. I was thinking, I was, I was flashback to uh, uh, Lampoon's uh, Christmas Vacation when the one cat bites the uh, wires you know, and Cousin Eddie's like, well, if he had nine laws, you just about used all of them up. And I was like, that's what flashed through my head. <laughs> so I, I so want to ask cycles, a quick question. A cycle's Christmas lights, is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead, Donnie. Um, this Kent Nelson, how is he related to the one from the 40s, the Golden Age? Is it the actual... Like a reincarnated I didn't Kent think it Nelson. Was at all. It was when we were um, looking up. I actually wanted to double check to make sure what the relationship was. I knew that Kent Nelson was related to the original Kent Nelson, but I didn't remember the actual relationship. He's the grand nephew of Kent Nelson, so this one's Kent okay. V Nelson. I don't know what the significance of the V, but this is the one that's created by Steve Gerber. I was re- I, I remember when this came out, this Countdown to Mystery. I was so excited because they were talking about series. And then the unfortunate events happened with Steve Gerber. But I was so excited. I'm like, Steve Gerber doing a Dr. Faith series. I'm like, that's going to be awesome. I was so excited for that. I'm glad that this character hasn't been dropped, though. Yeah. I'm glad that they, they, fi- they, they found a creative way to finish that miniseries. And then they shelved it for a while just to kind of get an idea of, like, okay, how are we going to kind of organically bring this character in? And, and to bring him into JSA, that makes the most sense. And I'm glad that this character's still around because it was a good idea. I like him being a new character. You pointed out something, Jim, and you're 100% correct. In the beginning of the issue, that was actually Dr. F- Dr. Midnight and Liberty Bell talking. I was jumping around because I started thinking about Mr. America and the various arguments that were going on throughout this whole thing. <laughs> Not right. arguments so much as there were various pairings discussions of characters and, yeah. and discussions. <laughs> so, the, ask, Liberty, Bell was, question, Liberty Bell was arguing with everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what's the blind guy looking at in the box? Well, he has, yeah, yeah. He has though technology that enables him to see the light spectrum, right? So he's able to see shapes and objects and things. Oh, I thought that was just in his costume yeah, goggles. Yeah. I didn't know that was his regular. Well, I think glasses. those glasses. If you take a look at those glasses, they are tinted in such a way that I, I guarantee you that those glasses are because he's yeah, mobile. He's I mean, he's obviously functioning. I was assuming the glasses were enabling him to do that the way his costume does. Yeah, he's because they the actually look like his goggles. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. you're right. You're the right. color, the they, color scheme, green okay. tint to them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I assumed that the glasses just functioned the way that his goggles did. Yeah. He's got the Jordy LaForge thing going. Well, that's what it was. Yeah. I was ta- I was taking it as that that it was the same thing that he gets out of his goggles. I'm, I'm, did you did you read it that? I don't know. Did you yeah. Read it that way. Uh, yeah. I. 
to be honest, I didn't even think twice about him looking in a box. Mm-hmm. And but I, I, I like the That's fact that he's question. wearing the dark glasses. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, Doctor Midnight, he's blind. Okay, and I didn't even think twice about. I actually looked at the color scheme of the glasses. Oh, okay. Because I, I was like, Hold okay, on. it matches the. Hold on. Look, see you, you, you see the color scheme of the glasses, but you miss the fact that there's a floating helmet following <laughs> Doctor Fate. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I saw the floating helmet. I just didn't catch the fact that in the one panel that we saw, you know? the old Dr. Fate, you know, or the real Dr. Fate, yeah. Kent Nelson, that he was holding it. I didn't yeah. catch the distinction I'm between the two. just busting your balls. Yeah. I, I, I just remember, remember the... dude, I already knew it was Mordru at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't... It wasn't really up in the air for me. <laughs> I just thought a blind guy looking for stuff in the box was going to finally. I thought Willingham was going to answer the que- the the age old question why there's braille and drive up ATMs. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Act. Well, it must be probably all those machines are. I would assume made the same. Well, yeah, th- yeah, they're all made the same way. That's what. It, but that's a big stand-up thing. Why mm-hmm. is uh, you? I guarantee if you go to a comedy club, there's going to be one guy who says that. <laughs> says that joke. I like seeing that Mr. Terrific wasn't instantly well. You know, like that after everything he went through, he was almost dead. Yeah. That they still were acknowledging the fact of what this guy went through, and that the doctor was still keeping him in the wheelchair, even though he felt like he was ready to go. I'm so glad that. It looks like he's running the team, too. Yeah, I, I'm, I took it that he's in command. Yeah. I don't know if you guys took it that uh, Did you take it that way, Donnie? Yeah, well, kind of. I, I kind of see, like, um, this more or less, like, uh, Green Lantern, Flash, and I think, like, uh, Mr. Terrific are all on the same, like... Uh, level? Level, yeah. Except I don't the, the JSA has a... always had a chairperson, though. They've always had somebody, so I, but they haven't identified that yet. Right. Because that's been throughout their history, they've always yeah. had a chairperson. So I'm, I'm curious to see who. Now wasn't wasn't Power Girl the chairwoman when the team split? Yes. Mm-hmm. And now she's on. Now is she the chairwoman on both teams, or is she no. just taking the mm-hmm. all uh, the all star? I, I would say if she was on both teams, we would have seen her in this issue. Yeah. I'm guessing that with the split, or well, I don't know. Well, because they talked about in All Stars that. She is the she has the one chair position, but he but Magog is the field general. Okay, because when she she when she counteracted his order, he's like, "Hey, you can't counteract my order in the field. I'm the field general. I'm field commander." You know, so she had the kind of chairperson position, you know, for all stars, but not you know when they're in the missions. I think that's something that I want to see more of. It's not a knock. I, I agree. I think, and this is what Donnie was mentioning before, I think one of the interesting things to me right now is after reading issue one of JSA All-Stars, I'm anxious for more of those questions to be answered as the series goes on. What is her role? Um, and, and how does it compare to Magog's? Because it really felt like in that issue that Magog was running the show, but I liked the distinction that he was saying that in the field. It was interesting, though, that in the field she could not hold back. It's hard when you're in command. You're in, when you when you're a leader. Mm-hmm. It's hard to step back and you know take orders. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. you know. And I like that distinction. I thought that was cool. Go ahead, Donnie. Well, especially if you're used to barking them in the field. Yeah. But, you know, you you just split this team. So now you know what I mean. Like just just last month, she was telling everybody what to do, and now she has to keep her mouth shut and let Magog go. Magog to me. Is the century of the DC universe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's how I feel about him. Because you know, the century in the Marvel universe is one of the most you know, like everybody just they either love him or want him to die. Yeah. And for me, Magog, I'm sorry. If anybody's to become a Black Lantern, do it, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's it's it's funny. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yet I find the dynamic interesting. Well, at first, when they first introduced him, before mm-hmm. he became a gog, mm-hmm. he was wasn't he the grand nephew of President Roosevelt? Mm-hmm. Yeah, who started the All Star Squadron, and effectively, when the war was over and All Star Squadron was disbanded, started the JSA. Right. So that's yeah, where there's that's, that's where legacy. the rich legacy history. Right. Is and I said, you know what, this character, I mean, he's got a toaster on his arm or whatever. I don't care. It's fantastic. Just the 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 history this guy has 
with this team. And then they turned him in, and then John's turned him into Magog. And I was like, no. And then I was like, well, maybe it'll be over once they beat Gog. And then they still became, he was still Magog. And I was like, no. What's interesting to me is the looming future for him, though. Yeah. Because from Booster Gold and all that, it does seem like this future is still in place for him. And can that change? Because I don't, the future is not set in stone. So will right. this character change? Will he, will he bend? Will he mold? From his solo series, it doesn't look like it. Um, especially from a solo series, like if you if you hate him in the All Stars, in his solo series, like. But I'm finding it's here's the funny part is I hate the guy, but I'm in, interested in him. Well, you know, it, it really took it took a lot for me not to buy that book because when I saw the preview art, mm-hmm. it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous, and I'm like, I'm not buying it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, in his inner dialogue, I want to punch him. Yeah. But yet, I, I'm enjoying the stories. I'm enjoying the book. So it's it, it's an interesting read for me because I'm not used to having a book where I adamantly feel that way. I really want to punch this guy. Yeah. Which is a sharp contrast to Secret Six where I'm reading about villains and I'm cheering for them. Yeah, you, you want to Mag- hang out Mag- with them. Yeah, Magog, right. Magog basically is being a soldier yeah. and I want to punch him. <laughs> See, I... I'm the more I'm reading Magog, the more I'm liking Magog, mm-hmm. and it's he he started off as the 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 character that I loved to read, but the person I didn't like. And then as I'm going, as he's going on, I'm like, you know what? There's some good qualities to this guy. He's a little bit gruff, and with the right you know you know content, there may be something positive come out of. And I'm rooting for the guy to instead of you know to you know instead of go full heel. You know, do a face turn. I'm rooting for him to come on. <laughs> I love you know? everything with you is wrestling. Yeah. Talk. <laughs> well, it's easier. And I say... watch it more than you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here, part of the reason I do that because I, I think you know, fa- face turn or heel turn mm-hmm. sounds better than good guy or bad guy for some reason. I just mm-hmm. I like saying that it sounds cooler, and I am. You know, I think he's always gonna. I think he's gonna be a gray area. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's always he's always gonna have that, and I'm gonna avoid doing my standard. You know, comparison. So. Okay, but because <laughs> you know well, exactly. Yeah, but see, that, that's a dangerous area to be in because that could go either way. Yeah, you, sure. you know, really, you could be the next Stone Cold Steve Austin mm-hmm. if we're going to go at wrestling and <laughs> yeah. <analogies>. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, or you could be the next Jamie Noble. Right. You know, Ooh. so I, it doesn't me, always it's, work. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just. You, did you? Do you guys read the Shield? Oh yeah. Oh God, I love the Shield. I now, love, I love I, that book. I loved how he treated Magog. I did too. You know, he he treated him like you know. All right, you know, I'm in a situation here. I don't. This guy's a dillweed, but I do need the backup. So we're just going to deal with him <laughs> in the situation. And then when the thing was over, he was like, you know, don't let the door hit you later. Bye. You know. And and there's fun. It was cool to see, and I liked that aspect of the that shield issue. You saw two guys with a strong military background who were two very different people. Right, exactly. And, and who had two very different concepts on what it means to be a good soldier. And I thought that was interesting to see that distinction. And I liked that because it just shows that people in the military are just as diverse as people in any other field. Yeah. And sometimes when whenever you have a military character, they're portrayed as very much all of them fall in sync. They always get along. They always have... You know, the exact same ideology, same side, which isn't real life. And I liked that aspect of it, was to see the two of them. To me, it felt more realistic. I thought it was a great portrayal of the two. I lo- That issue oh, yeah. was, that that was, was, that was a highlight yeah. for me. Now, do, Jim, do you find you're liking, like, I'm enjoying Magog's book. I love the solo series, but I don't like him at all. You, you're warming up to you're warming up to him, and I actually, I'm, I'm actually, this is, this is, I love the book because I don't like him, because I think that Giffen's characterization of him is spot on. I think it's exactly what Donnie and I are talking about right now with the character. So I'm enjoying like getting more into his head from that aspect of it, but I want, I still want to punch the guy. You're warming up to him though. Where do you think that's coming from? Because. <laughs> He reminds me of a sergeant major I knew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he really reminds me of uh, one of the sergeant majors. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the guy had this, this knack to anger me. 
And I mean, just in, it just evoked just pure anger and rage out of me. But he was doing it to get me to, you know, you know, to be the best I could be. And I, I now, you know, years later, I can recognize, you know, some of, you know, what his actions, what his tactics. And he actually was even smart enough to recognize sometimes, you know, when to back off, when to, you know, push it and stuff like that. So I see, you know, the, I kind of see a little bit of, you know, of Magog in him. And so it's, that's part of the connection. But I also do think that there's, there is some underlining good in him. Like, with his dealing with that waitress, the way he dealt with the waitress getting smacked around, it's, you know, he could have very easily gone and beat up the guy, beat up her husband. No. He's going to teach her how to defend herself. He's going to give her the confidence and the, the ability to fight off not only one attack, but future attacks. And, I, and just yeah. the way he's talking about the training where he lets her hit him and draws a little blood, blood and she gets a little excited about that. She's glad. And he's like, he's giving her this, not just the knowledge how to fight, but the confidence to use it. And a traditional hero wouldn't handle that in that way. I did like that. I think that was something that was interesting about him that he did in a very different way. Uh, I mean, that also has, like Donnie was saying before, there's a potential to backfire because what happens now if she's become too aggressive? (laughs) You know, you could send her spiraling in a completely different direction. But I think that's, again, it it shows something different about him. I don't see Jay Garrick training her that way, for example. No. And I do like that he shows respect to, like, he likes Jay. He likes Alan. He likes... Mr. Terrific at times when he's in what he calls quote-unquote checkmate mode. There are things about the legacy characters that he likes and respects, but yet he knows that he will never be one of them and he'll never fit in like that. And that is a distinction between them. I'm anxious in All-Stars to see him and Power Girl butting heads. It's got to happen. Oh, that's coming. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Because, I mean, the two of them are going to have very different ideas. Uh, Stargirl. There's no way Stargirl is going to just sit back and watch everything he does and not. Uh, there's going to be some conflict on that team and some bending and some. And I think that is going to be an interesting dynamic on that team. It does remind me a lot more. It's funny, we were talking about the different teams from the past. It does remind me a lot more of All Star Squadron and Infinity Inc. Because Infinity Inc., there was a distinct different feel to Infinity Inc than from the regular All-Star Squadron team. There was something fresh and different and new about them. And that works for All-Stars, as long as we've got this feeling like All-Star Squadron. Right. And I I like that. That distinction for me is so much what I want out of this. I'm sorry, Donnie. No, uh, the basic thing I was going to say was like, um, you know, Infinity Inc., back when there was an Earth 1 and Earth 2, the best way to describe Infinity Inc. was they were kind of like the Teen Titans of Earth 2. Yeah. In a sense, you know, but they were legacy characters all at the same time, the son and daughter. Now, do you think, do you think, um, Magog likes Jay Garrick and, um, and Green Lantern for the simple fact that they are like World War II veterans? I think there's And he respects that aspect. He does have, in his own, in, in the solo series, there's a lot of inner dialogue with him especially when it came to Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick appears in there a lot. But the funny part, he respects them, yet he doesn't feel like he has to be confined to following the rules that they do, which is, I thought, I think that's something that I find interesting, that they haven't, because to me, I like the fact that I dislike him. I know that sounds like a strange thing to say. I, (laughs) I, I I don't want this character all of a sudden to be, like a, when you talked about face and heel, I don't want this guy to all of a sudden just be magically a good guy. That to me is always cheap. You know, it's we, we don't like this. There's something like Donnie and the, the emotion that Donnie and I have about this guy is real because of the storytelling that's come before. So I don't want a magic wand wave and all stars. Magog is all of a sudden the kind of leader where I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want from a JSA leader. He isn't, and right. I, that's what I'm finding interesting about him over there is the fact that he isn't the kind of leader I traditionally would want for the JSA. I don't like the guy. Uh, He's sneaky. He goes around behind the backs of the legacy heroes. But it's funny, though, Jim, you, and I think there's a distinction between you and me and our view of characters and history with them. Donnie and I have a history with the JSA that reaches back to the 80s. And actually, honestly, for me, it reaches back 
to the 70s with the old JSA JLA crossovers. I've always right. liked these characters. They're rich characters who throughout my childhood straight on through and to me they always were your top tier any any appearance they had, they were true tried and true superheroes. And there was nothing corny about them in any of their appearances. Um it was, hey, I loved Super Friends growing up, but they never had, like, I mean, Super Friends, you could look back at some of those episodes, and they were a little corny. I, when I was reading JLA and JSA crossovers, any appearances with these characters, there was nothing corny about them. You know, I mean, they were true, you know, heroes. And they've always had that legacy aspect, especially because of the long history with these characters. So I'm in that place, and I think I'm grounded and rooted into them. It's you don't have that history, you don't have that um, baggage with them. So right. you're seeing them with fresh eyes. You're seeing Magog with fresh eyes that I can't see him with. Yeah, it's you know, and even just the connection to the Magog from you know um, thingy. Uh-huh. Uh, Kingdom Come. <laughs> Thank you. Kingdom Come. Yeah, <laughs> from Kingdom Come. Kingdom also known as Thingy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why can I not remember the name? I actually bought the alternate version of the absolute, absolute thingy. At least I didn't say whatnot. With, yeah. With, with good, I think with, I picked that up at a convention myself. Yeah, absolute thingy, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, they have, they have it at 50% off every so often, and you can grab it. And it's um, with art by that guy. Yeah. <laughs> the guy with the hair. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I know that guy. With that yeah. guy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was written by the guy who did the thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, see? I love that guy. And he actually did, so that's the good thing about it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute thing he actually was done by a guy who wrote the thing. See? <laughs> We're choking Jim right now. It's funny. <laughs> so anyway, while while Jim's trying to recover himself, Kid Card Evil. I'd love to talk about Kid Carnival because I love this kid. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> He's awesome. Now, did you, Donnie? Did you see it when it, in the in the series when this actual reveal of him? I was actually swerved a little bit. Oh yeah, sure. Because I, I was wondering. I'm like, okay, did did he get one pulled over on him? Was somebody controlling him? I was. T- they got me on this one. I love him now because of the swerve. I love that, you know, I love when he's totally now, he doesn't have to. He's pure evil mode now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to put up any kind of brave face right now. I'm going to tell you guys how it is. And I like, it's nice to see a villain character that has no fear. Yeah. He has no fear right now. He knows. He's like, what, he's like what the Joker would be in junior high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, I think the scary part about him, though, is he's a little more lucid. <laughs> right. Yeah, he seems less crazy, more evil, fanatical. Yeah, it's there's a pure evil in him, and I like the the comment about actually, how you know what your idea of pure evil though. I think yeah. there's something more, even more so than fanatical. Yeah, it's just at his core, he's rotten. Yeah, there's just and he likes being rotten. Yeah. Well, he has the line basically where heaven won't take me and hell's afraid I'll take over, and he's actually been in that scenario where hell mm-hmm. kicked them back and said we don't want you get out of here and also that's a- well this is the kid that wasn't he the one in, in salvation run who asked the joker for his autograph and then <laughs> told him that he was gonna kill him in his sleep so he could be the next big thing or something like that yeah 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 <laughs> you gotta have some big cojones to talk that way to the joker in the dcu you know, cause considering half the villains didn't even want to be on his team. I hope right. you're going su- to survive. <laughs> I know, I, I like that Alan Scott's uh, focus on his son, though. I know, but I'm loath to do it until I find out exactly what he did to my son. You know, they don't want to turn them over to the proper authorities because they're like, I need to know what happened. And, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I, have- I like that reminder of this because he's a dad. And I think we need to know that this is something that's weighing on his mind. Because uh, their relationship, I've enjoyed following Alan Scott's relationship with his son and with Jade and how they came back together and how that wasn't easy. you know. And, and he built a relationship with them over time that was very hard to get to. They had some right. violent confrontations where Obsidian was really pretty nuts for a while there. Uh, and the two of them were, you know, Obsidian wasn't a good guy <laughs> for part of it. <laughs> Well, that and and he's also taking it from a father who has already lost one child. Yes, 
and doesn't know what happened to the other. Yeah. You know, I mean, so he, he must be frantic. You know, he's got to know what's going on. It's it's funny how, with the rich history of these characters, how much... And I, I for anybody that, at, at conventions a lot of times, and at comic shops and, and different places, you can you can find these archive editions at really good prices. You get them at like 50% off and stuff like that. Do yourself a favor and try some of the Golden Age material. Because, I, you know, people give the Silver Age a hard time sometimes, and I actually quite like Silver Age material. But the Golden Age really holds up to today. And some of that, I mean, it's I, I wouldn't go and like buy tons of it until you've given it a taste. Um, right. Those those Chronicle volumes are a good way, you know, if you want to pick up like a Batman Chronicles or Superman Chronicles or something, that's a good way to, um, on the cheap, try Golden Age material to see if you like the flavor of it. But uh, I'm talking specifically about some of the older material with these JSA characters. I have... Uh, the first volume of the Green Lantern archives with Alan Scott, and it's really good. I mean, it's it's great material. It holds up really well, and it's interesting to see what this character was like in the Golden Age writing. So, for anybody that's interested in that history, but I mean, do, you know, I don't want to, you know, do it on the cheap. You know, try to get yourself a volume of any of these with the Flash or any of them on the cheap if you like these characters and try it out because I do think more so than the Silver Age material even I think for today's audience it holds up I, I, from a history aspect I love reading the Silver Age material I love seeing how a lot of these stories get laid out but it doesn't hold up as well for all fans I think as the Golden Age material does I, I don't know for some reason that material just seems to be a little bit more timeless and I just think it's uh the, I think it's interesting material to check out because I've I've gotten very into these characters and it is it, it is due to the Robinson Johns Goyer and the work that was done on that JSA series that really I think kind of entrenched me. I always loved All Star Squadron and I always loved Infinity Inc and I loved them since as a kid, but I think reading them every single month in the JSA series when it hit was really where it, like heavily invested me and Starman I think heavily invested me in these characters you know the point where I gotta be honest with you this is more so than the Justice League this team because of that groundwork this is my DCU team like they do take a they do take a step up from the Justice League for me they're more important to me and you know, for JLA fans who you know are like, what are you crazy or anything? I, no disrespect to you, but this team, I care about them so much now. I've gotten so entrenched in them that they matter to me in a way, which is funny because the Justice League always has had my uh, my Hawkman on. Well, although JSA's had Hawkman, my favorite my favorite Hawkman stories came from JSA. So Hawkman's not a good example from uh, the Satellite League, but, but Batman, 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 who's you know my, that's my go to character. Great runs on JLA, but JSA still, to me, comes up a little bit ahead of them. They're more well, important to me. It, it all goes back to the legacy thing, because if there was no JSA, there would be no JLA. And it's the bottom line. And that's something, you know, the funny part is, I think that's where it took a step up for me. Because when the JLA-JSA crossovers, and even when we were reading All-Star Squadron and Infinity Inc., it was an alternate Earth. Right. So... Like Batman and Superman were on the JSA, and then they had you know passed on. Well, I mean Batman had passed on, you know, and um, so I mean that they were a part of that. When they rebooted everything with Starman, and then brought actually the JSA to our Earth with uh, Zero Hour and things like that, and made it that they had actually predated the JLA. I think bringing them into this world, they did take on even more of a legacy aspect. It felt like the golden age really happened in our world. And right, I think right. that's where, I think you're right, Donnie, it is that legacy aspect, mm -hmm. and it is something where DC's kind of done a nice job of rebooting where all of their history happened again. The golden age happened, the silver age happened. Like, it's fun to read the showcases right now and realize that those things happened. So I think it's fun for fans to be able to go back, and it's where continuity is kind of fun. You can read something and feel like it did happen and it did matter and did predate what you're currently reading now. So it is fun for anybody who isn't reading any of the older material. It's fun to kind of go back and check out some of this stuff and just see because it, it did all happen now. Well, I mean, that's, that's the one thing I love about the DC Universe is the fact of the legacy aspect where you, you don't really see that in, in say, uh, you know, to go to the other big two, the Marvel Universe. Whereas even, you know, you saw when, uh, when Green Arrow got all blowed up, his son goes and takes his place, you know? 
He's the new Green Arrow. The, just what's going on in the Batman books with Dick stepping up, and uh, what you know, and what happened with Barry, and how Wally Wally was the first one well, in the know. in the modern age to step up and be the new quote unquote legacy character. I'm going to say this though, like the Captain America stuff that was going on with Bucky taking over Winter Soldier. Right, right. They did a fantastic job with that. I oh, mean, sure. That, so, I mean, uh, one of the, I'll say this, though. I like the distinction between Marvel and DC. To me, I, I think as fans, it would stink. And I'm not saying you're not saying this, Donnie. I, I'm with you in the sense I like the legacy aspect of the DC Universe. That fits. I mean, you and I are totally in sync on that. I like the fact, though, when I read a Marvel book and I read in the Marvel Universe, it feels like a very different universe. There's nothing cookie cutter about the two. I don't want there to be. Right, I, right, right. I, it's, I think it's it's fun. To, it, I mean, otherwise, who, you know, I mean, what what's the distinction? Who cares? I, I love the distinction. I think Mar- Marvel has a different flavor. It just does. DC has a different flavor. It just does. It's not about, to me, which one's better or which one's worse. It's, as fans, we win because we get something different. When I read Captain America, there's, I get something in a Captain American book that I, I don't get in the DC Universe. And I don't necessarily, and I not nothing that I don't necessarily want that. I was glad that the Shield didn't feel like DC trying to force Captain America into the DC universe. The Shield is a great example of a character where I'm like, I wanted a character that felt like a, you know, kind of like your soldier type of um, American hero type of thing. But he does not feel at all like Steve Rogers to me or Bucky. For that no, matter. no, not even close. And I right. applaud them for handling that. But I like the distinction between the mm-hmm. two. Go ahead. This is here's the sequence that I want I, I wanted to talk about right here with um, the whip yeah. and Mr. America because <laughs> I think that was a very cool aspect of this whole thing was he didn't know what was, was going to do Mr. Terrific was bored and was tinkering with his whip <laughs> yeah but I, I was I Mr. America this is one of the characters there was some about this character he grabbed me from the first issue of this series when it relaunched. because he feels like actually going back to what Donnie and I just talking about he feels like a legacy character. I have very little background. I don't know too much about Mr. America history or anything like that. I love that this series has kind of introduced him and brought him in. He feels like something. Uh, did, Donnie, did you read any of Young All Stars? Uh, I th- like the first sixteen issues or so. Yeah. I think I have. He fe- yeah. feels to me like a character who would have been on Young All Stars with Iron Monroe and all his other characters on there. Uh, there Dance was Dynamite. There were, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. he, he yeah. was a character that, like you plot Mister America, and they're like, okay, he could have been a part of the Young All Stars. It would have been that type of character would have fit there. So when he came out, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting this. I'm getting this vibe. There's something cool about this guy. I was so glad to see that they brought him onto this team. I like the idea of like kind of bumping up his whip to make him, him more effective. Yeah, you know. So now, now all of a sudden, okay, and I'm gonna love seeing how he gets used to using this thing because the two of them were almost killed. <laughs> wow, <laughs> just such a great line. See, I like the dialogue between um, him and Jennifer, just going a little bit back and forth. Where she's like, at first, like Mr. Graves is like, "Oh, I'm not that old. Come on," mm-hmm. and just you know, but it's her, you know, how she was raised. You know, you don't. You know, it's he is an elder. It is someone you have. They have a little respect for, but they are teammates. So it's they're beyond the Mister and Misses. It's you know, Jeff. Come on, you know. I don't, I just like seeing the uh, the cycle through. And just one simple page. It's not a lengthy conversation, but it is a nice to see that. You know, one we're talking legacy. She is a legacy hero as well, and there's some connection back to her father. I want to reiterate again, if you guys are reading this, anybody listening, and you haven't read The 80-Page Giant, if you're enjoying both of these books, do yourself a favor and pick that baby up. Oh, because, God, yeah. Because um, this Mr. America story in there was really cool. But I liked the each, – each one of the stories spotlighted one of these characters. I do like the idea that these – that uh, I think it's All-Stars that's getting the co-feature, spotlighting characters. And I think so, yeah. Yeah. I'm, ho- I, I'm hoping that that'll be any of the characters from the JSA because I'd like to see – not just the ones that are on All Stars. I'd like to see these characters as well. I don't necessarily want two co features, though. So I'm hoping both books aren't getting a co. I'm hoping it's one or the other gets a co feature and that's it. Um, but I do like the idea of a co feature spotlighting them. Mm-hmm. Actually, versus doing. Because if you're going to have two JSA series <laughs> now, I don't necessarily want a third series that's like classified brought back because I loved classified this would to me would be a nice alternative to do the kind of storytelling you're able to do in classified in one of these books because then it's only another buck versus buying a whole other series <laughs> <laughs> at this point and I, I 
that would be my preference at this point. Mm. Mr. Terrific getting up and just kind of finally saying, you know, Doctor, I do believe you've been overruled. That was such a cool moment. Yeah. <laughs> but he does make a little blunder there because he runs into Jesse. <laughs> I was dying. As soon as he started talking to her, I'm like, oh, this is not going to go but, well. But here's the thing, though. I, I, I understood the side of the other characters because, I mean, this is something I, I've gone through this with uh, multiple friends and family members. And it's always an awkward thing because you want to say something to somebody if they're in a divorce. Let's forget divorce situations, relationship breakups, things like that. I've been on both sides of the fence on this type of thing as well. You know, it's, you never know the right thing to say. It's always awkward, but yet you need to because you want that person to know that you're there for them. And it is so funny that considering the situation, the JSA has always been like a family. It's been the society, true, but it's always been like a family as well. So the family has split, and it's natural that they would think, and I love this because, Donnie, you were right. This is so playing off the fanboys. And I'm one of them because it was one of the things when they talked about splitting up the teams and I saw they were going to be on separate teams. First thing I said was, I don't want to see these two split up the marriage. I will be so angry if they do that. I love that they didn't. Right, because you know it would be so unnatural if they did because they, they never did a story arc where there'd be any, there was any problems or a hint of any problems whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So if they just were like, you know what, we're getting a divorce, you go over there. And I'm going to stay here. And, you know, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't have seemed natural, you no. know. Even, and, te- uh, even team I, I like how they, they paid attention to the message boards, in a sense. And they saw what the fans were talking about. And they said, all right, we're going to have fun with you. That's good writing. And it, it's, it's knowing your audience as well. I think that's important. I think that's a key. And I, I applaud creators for doing it nowadays. I think they try to get to know their audience. I, I also applaud creators, though, in the sense they get to know their audience but they don't necessarily feel that they have to kowtow to us because I think that's also a mistake yeah. you can make very quickly. I think knowing your audience and how to play around with it is a good move because you're, you're addressing things that we're talking about, but at the same time, they've got a story they're telling, they have a direction they're going. Splitting those two up was a great move, and that's what I mean. I think it's, it's, a, get- tricky, it's a tricky balance for creators. How do you pay attention to what your audience is doing but at the same time saying, we've got a direction... We've got to do some things that are going to get people talking and that they're going to eventually think are cool But because we've got a direction planned. We're going in a certain place. So how do we find that balance? It's an interesting, tricky balance that you've got to have as a creator, and it's a tough place to be in. You know, and I, I like I, – I, they're doing a pretty interesting, doing a, yeah. an doing, interesting job of, of paying attention and yet um, having some fun at the same time. And that's, that's the balance that I'm talking about. I like it. I'm, I'm digging this. Really? We can't tell. <laughs> well, you know what? Honestly, this was the issue, though. I needed to see some legacy. And I'm seeing this here. So this kind of... Because I enjoyed All Stars, the first issue, a great deal. But I was with Donnie in the sense that I wanted to see the legacy book as well. I needed both. Like, I was perfectly fine. I thought All Stars out of the starting gate, because I kicked off as an interesting, great series. I hate Magog, but <laughs> I like the book. Yeah. There's a huge distinction there. Like, the book was fun. I, I really dug it. And it's ev- the reasons why I hate Magog were incredibly well written. So, I mean, it, you know, it was everything that I wanted. But this was what I really needed here. <laughs> the t- yeah, terrific. I love the look on Terrific. This is some good artwork, too. Yeah. Jesse, are you okay? And the look on his face. Uh-huh. I would run for my life. <laughs> well, how do you outrun a speedster, though? <laughs> Next thing you know, you hear the three tricks say you whatever the equation is. <laughs> like, oh, dang it, can't is she outrun her. The equation still, I don't remember. She still uses it, yeah. Yeah. Well, she did in the uh, Flash Rebirth. Yeah. I don't think she needs to do it. I think she does it as Cause a, I, I, cause a I thought nod. That, yeah. Because I thought that was something that they re- they actually realized that in Flash they don't need them. Yeah. I think it's kind of a psychological thing and a nod, too. But yeah. It's cool. Now, uh, we get to see Dr. Fate with Jay Garrick. This worked for me, too, because we've seen this guy now with everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was especially the legacy heroes, the ones you know who have a rich history, and the ones like Jay Garrick's the one that brought him in. Yeah, it, here's the thing: um, this page actually, I kind of had a clue that they knew, but I still wasn't 100 percent certain. And here's why: it was when he goes up to him, like um, you know, uh, Doctor Fate, or do you prefer Kent, or you prefer being called Kent? He, Jay's the one who brought him in. Jay would have already asked that question to him. And so he would already know what he prefers. Mm-hmm. 
you know, just that's, you know, that's a good catch, actually. That, and and I, you know, it's it was one of those things as I was reading it because I wanted them to know. And I'm like, come on, how come they don't know? How can they know? And I was, I, I one, I found it funny, you know, and I was kind of enjoying it. But then when I read that, I was like, does he know? But I, I couldn't, and I can't even say I knew 100 percent that they knew by that. But that was just the one thing there because I was like, do you prefer Kent? Wait, he he knows, doesn't he? And that Let's was. See. This is how I like how they wrote this. This is Jay Garrick. This is a guy who has been a superhero for decades, and he knows the game. He's been around the block a couple of times, shall we say. He didn't come in there, and he, I mean, he knew this guy was not Kent. He was not Dr. Fate, but he didn't come in there hostile. He said, you know what? Hey, you know what we're going to do? We're having this meeting. You want to come in this room with us? He was very cool. Very casual, and brought him in there, and 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 made uh, what's his name, Mordor, Mord- Mordor, Mordru, Mordru. Sorry, made him feel like you know what these people have no idea. They still think I'm Doctor Fate, and then you turn the page. Well, here's the thing: I love to that <laughs> fool me once, but it's not going to happen again with the JSA. Right, exactly. And, and when you, t- but I love when you take a lead, guys. Here, here we go through here, and the stance of all of them. It's funny reading when I read this again. I so totally noticed. They were all battle ready. Mm-hmm. Like this, they were not set for a meeting. Alan, Alan has his ring ready to go. Uh, you know why does Jesse have to be in lightning mode? Why does Mister America have to have his whip out and ready to go? She's putting on her mask. Mister Terrific now has put on his mask at this point. These characters have all gotten themselves psychologically in battle mode. Does Doctor Midnight at a team meeting have to be wearing full garb? He wasn't earlier. Why do you have to? So these were all things that I thought was really interesting. I love, and we didn't talk about this, that they're in the JLA cave. Yeah. I love the nod to the kind of like the past of the DC universe. Just, <laughs> you know, that, that relationship, we're going to temporarily borrow this. This was a great, there was great lines in there too. Like, well, what happened to their moon bases and satellites that we have to use <laughs> half a cave? <laughs> yeah, you can have the cave, but only the first half. You can't right. have the back half. Yeah, we need that. It's like, oh yeah, you got your moon, you got your satellite, you got your moon, you got this. Oh yeah, sure. But first item of business, who are you and what are you doing inside of Dr. Fate's body? That was just, it was so cool. And I loved how they just went through and they talked about all the clues and that was just really cool. And that they had ma- magical things set up and technological warnings set up against undercover intrusion because of what happened to them previously. Yeah. They were not going to get hit again. Well, I, I like, you know, when uh, we saw with the, the Batcave had those things up there. You know, that one uh, Batman issue where, you know, Two-Face got, you know, teleported into it. You know, when those, you know, the magic barriers got dropped down. I like the fact seeing that these heroes think of this type of stuff and throw it out there. You know, the JLA has has to have those type of barriers on the satellite and on also on the Hall of Justice that's in D.C. They have these special security measures. It's just not an open building. They know when you're coming in. They got the alarms and all that. So I like seeing that. Now, here's where I got sold, and the reason why I'm geeking out so heavily about all this. Mr. Trivik's asking, so once again, who are you? Do we have to wait for an answer? You know, we've got the Liberty Bell. You know, we'll find out in a second or two anyway, and I'm really in a mood to hit someone. <laughs> and I mean, it's just a classic superhero moment. At this point in time, they know, you know, we're... You know, inter- emotions are running really high, but this is a superhero stance. They know that they are right now in the presence of somebody who infiltrated to do some harm. So, prettier words were never spoken. Forget the speeches. Let's start the sweet science. And this is not something you'd see from the All Stars team. Right. They don't operate this way. And that was a distinction that I was looking for in this title. It makes the two teams interesting to me. It gives me what I desperately wanted right here. Like that shot right there is so what I want to see from this book. It's so what I want to see from these characters. And it leads right into, I love that he's already out of Fate's body, which means we're going to see Dr. Fate in action the next issue. If he wakes up, because well, I'll get too. dropped him yeah, hard. True too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, look, the, next, knock down, drag out, no holes barred. I'm excited. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's real. It's it was already exciting, and it's I, I like that. I'm looking right here. We see the whole team, one on the floor, but we see the whole team right here, <laughs> and it's a good looking team. I mean, that is that to me. This team looks like the JSA. I just thought of something, you know, because you mentioned how you know all the people used to be in the helm and all that stuff. 
I'm wondering if they're going to end this, you know, dealings with Marjorie by having by uh, the current Doctor trap him back into the helmet, and he'll start rebuilding the people inside his helmet. He can't. Oh, okay. Uh, I, no, no, no. I mean, um, he could trap Mordru in there. Let me let me clarify that. But um, there was a resolution to Nabu. There was a resolution to Kent Nelson and his wife. There's been a resolution to everybody who was in the helmet as far as why that can't happen. I, I mean, I guess uh, let me. I should take that back. If the writers really wanted to go there, they could. I don't see that happening. I could see Mordru getting trapped in there. Going. I was just thinking saying. he rebuilds his population inside the helmet. I think it's far more interesting, though, and I think what they're exploring here, and I might be wrong, maybe they got a cool story in mind for the other reason, but uh, for me, as a Doctor Fate fan, I think this is far more interesting to see this guy with a blank slate trying to learn what he can do and maybe doing some things as Doctor Fate that we've never seen before because he's thinking outside the box. He's going to be experimenting as he's going along. He's going to be learning as he goes along. I don't know. I mean, this is a new age of magic. I kind of like this blank slate. I don't know. I, I'm open-minded to a lot of that. I love the legacy of there being you know, a rich history to pull off of from that helmet, but I could go either way. Donnie, where are you at with any of this, actually? Go ahead. Like Dr. Fate or anything? Are you What What do you want from him? Do you, do you want like this blank slate that we have now? Do you want... More of the history. Yeah, I want. I want to see him progress. I want to see him grow. I I want to see maybe a uh, some kind of a, of relationship with his great uncle via through the helmet or something to that effect. But uh, my my one big question is for the next issue, which I love is, you have a big bad mystical baddie in front of you, and the only person that messes with the <laughs> mystic, mystic arts wildcat just knocked out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whoops <laughs> no here's the thing and I'll, that fits wildcat yeah. though <laughs> no. exactly and it's like well good luck i can't wait to see what happens now <laughs> now here's the funny thing is i'm thinking mordru saw the punch coming so he hopped out of the body and that was really kent standing there that uh, wildcat knocked unconscious that could be he could have been in the process of leaving because you don't yeah. really see that's funny because the panel before he gets before he gets knocked out, that helmet is still floating behind his head when they're when they're confronting him. So he didn't leave the body yet. Okay. Unless maybe maybe when he was unconscious, it forced him out of the. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know when he uh, left the body, but it was just kind of. <laughs> he's gonna wake up going, "Oh, who hit me? What the heck, guys? <laughs> Come on! I'm, excited. I'm sick of this team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for both." JSA books in 2010 right now. Yes, big time. This this like solidified for me. I, I Donnie and I are completely in sync in the sense that I want more of this legacy aspect from this book, and I want it to continue. Now, let me let me ask you this, Donnie. I know are you where are you at with All Stars? Are you interested in f- continuing to follow All Stars? Oh, I'm going to follow it. I mean, I trust I trust the right uh, I trust the writer. I I mean, you know, like I, the only negative thing about it is. I don't want them to take away the the leg. I don't want them to turn it into a strike force because it just doesn't fit the JSA label. That's that's what I mean. Like you know, I, for for them to be a mil, quote unquote like militaristic team does not fit the JSA label. You know, if if that's what you want to do, then split them from the team and make them an entirely different. You know, something that's not related to the JSA. But See, I mean, you know, you just. It was one issue, so I'm not. I'm not going to be that guy. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. But I mean, it's it, it is interesting. I, see, to me, that's why I wanted you on because I think it's an interesting perspective. Because I loved. I I I am reading. I'm personally reading them as a completely different team. Yes, they're under that banner, right? And that is an interesting distinction. I do think that Power Girls being there is a lot more about her keeping an eye on Magog than anything else. I do think that she's got a, and we saw it. I, I liked. See, the funny thing is, I do recommend for anybody if you haven't read. Did you read JSA versus Cobra? Yes. Yeah, I do recommend for everybody to read JSA versus Cobra if you've been kind of following this whole splitting of the team and all that. It's not a throwaway miniseries at all. Uh, it's it really kind of establishes distinct differences between Mister Terrific and Power Girl, which I really liked because I think to me it added to the reasons why she's over on the other squad. And why there would be a split between them, and it does show them as both as two very strong leaders with two very different ways of operating, and they were butting heads throughout that. Yet respecting, 
you come through at the end, they, they respect each other a great deal and both make mistakes along the way because of those differences. And it, to me, it made more sense. It, it, like it, uh, Trotman did a great job, I thought, of writing that as far as kind of adding to this mythos that we got going right now. So it really felt like it was running, if not concurrently, it ran somewhere along the lines with all of this. And I don't care where it fell in, it just felt thematically like it was a part of all this. And I really dug that miniseries a great deal for that purpose because it kind of goes that way. I, the conversation with her and Stargirl in the first issue was pivotal to me. And that was one of the reasons why I'm very interested at the moment because it's not all just, hey, Magog's right, let's do what Magog wants. Right, right. She's got questions too. And we saw that in the first issue. I needed to see that. And I'm going I'm to be curious to see what the other team members are like because we saw like our man kind of playing around with them a little bit and things like that throughout. And I don't think Magog just shouting orders all the time is going to work for everybody. No. So there's going to have to be, and it, I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic. I want to see that because I don't think this is a different way of operating and there's going to be some headbutting over this and there's going to have to be some bending and what is that going to look like? So foundation-wise, as a first issue, it's got me intrigued. So that's kind of where I'm at on that one. This It's, one, like, it's oh, like an action movie. It is, yeah. And I mean, I, I'm there. I'm going to be getting it. But, uh, I mean, like I said, you know, I, I trust the creative teams and, you know, it's just... It, it, see... When I was a kid, All Star Squadron was one of the first comics I ever got, and that introduced me to a lot of the history of DC. So, like a lot of these Golden Age heroes, they I, I've just been attached to them for so long, and I just don't want to see someone take my toys and not play with them the way I want to play with them. You, you, you know, know what I mean? It's the funny thing that you're saying that though. I've got to be honest. I'm with you in that sense because I've said this since the start of this whole thing. I like Fables and Jack of Fables so much. In exactly. the way that they've been doing that, and uh, House of Mystery, and you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm enjoying their work. That I'm like, okay, and and both books, uh, you know, both that whole concept, the Fables world, deals with a large cast like this, and they've managed to kind of divvy that up in such a way that it makes sense, and yet it all feels part of the same big world. That I have a lot of confidence they're going to do a great job with this. I think a different creative team. I don't know if I'd be as confident right now. I'd still be following it because I'm enjoying these. I enjoyed these issues. Like if this was written by somebody else, but it was the same issues, you know, where I didn't have the name and the experience with them. Let's say it was new creators, people right. we people we didn't have a, a history with. I would still be on board, but I don't think my confidence would be as high as it is right now. This creative team, my confidence is there. Exactly. What about, no, and, Jim, and, where, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Donnie. We've all collected for a long time, mm-hmm. so so we know. Give it a story arc. If it's not your cup of tea, it's not your cup of tea. That's you always that, uh, arc, an arc is always good advice because I think by an arc you'll know that uh, it works. Actually, I'll say this though. I'll, I'll give an example. I liked McKeever's Titans a great deal. The mm-hmm. first arc for me wasn't the selling point on his run on Titans though. The first arc was his future Titans arc that he did, and it was actually the second arc where I was like, okay, I'm getting what this guy's doing now. I'm really into it. It was uh, Wonder I, Dog, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Wonder Dog one was cool. The Wonder Dog one was real. <laughs> but it was, it was funny. The fr- it wasn't the first arc that I was really sold. It was the second one. Now, Jim, what about you? See, I'm completely different than you guys on this one because, as you said earlier, you know, Earl, I do not have the lengthy baggage. I have, I do have a history with JSA, and I went back and picked up and reread the classified, you know, JSA classified, reread from, you know, number one of this current run. So I've got that kind of history, but I don't have multiple JSA runs. You know, so the concept of I, I get and I like the uh, concept of the legacy heroes, and to be honest, JSA is now listed a step above JLA for me. Whereas when we first started this stuff, I was like, no, JLA you know, is a, a team that I have. I had JLA over JSA. Just going back and reading everything, I do like this team. But for me, when the split was announced, I was like, okay, this could be some really cool you know, kind of concepts and stories and whatnot. So I was looking forward to this split. I, again, I had some issues, you know, when we're talking about the, you know, with Jesse and Our Man, I didn't want to see the breakup, and, you know, they addressed it. I like seeing this, the, the turmoil on the All-Stars team, because they're not completely meshing yet, and it's going to take some time. I think the kidnapping, you know, well, what happened with, um, you know, Stargirl, I think that's going to help actually mesh that team together a little bit. 
you know, it'll kind of like, you know, that whole conflict, you know, kind of builds camaraderie. So that's going to help out the team. I'm curious to see what happens, you know, in that story arc and just seeing just, you know, all the stuff with, between Power Girl and Magog. And I, as I've said earlier this episode, I like, I, I kind of like Magog. So it's another way to, for me to get some more Magog. And that Magog on that team seems very true to the Magog in the solo series. So that's a plus for me that we have two different series with that's running him that have very similar characters. So I'm thinking we're going to get some growth in one title, which will you know bleed over into the other and vice versa so yeah i'm i've really got high hopes for you know all stars and jsa that had just a great feel to it i loved that ending and looking forward to just seeing stuff like we talked about you know with uh, dr fate i really want to see that the the whole thing with there is still a legacy building new heroes in dr fate mr america and lightning so you still have that aspect yeah, i wouldn't want them all but to be established the heroes. Yeah, yeah but you do have these classic legacies on there so you got the both going on so it has a it's it's kind of in a way for me it's a way for them to shrink down the team without writing off the team you know without writing off members they shrunk it down to this more manageable size and i think that's a great way to handle it i'm not very giving, pleased not giving us identical books right they're definitely two completely distinctively different books, and I like that. And there is just this classic, but then there's this other feel, but the other feel even has somewhat of a classic feel to it, so... Holy caffeine! Guys, I, it was, and Donnie, this was your suggestion, actually, because I was, I was literally figuring we'd just do the JSA issue and then maybe just some casual chat, but you you'd said, why, why don't we talk some Blackest Night? And I knew we were doing a segment this weekend to talk about issues five and six. So I'm like, well, we can kind of do that. And maybe I'll invite Myrtle along. But you're like, no, let's talk about the JSA issue. And that makes, pr- I don't know the dunce that I was. I wasn't even <laughs> thinking that way. This was one of the things I've got to compliment on this one before we even get heavily into the issue is the artwork. I think oh, the, co- yeah. the cover is spectacular. Eddie Barrows, uh, his Titans run, I adored. But this whole creative team, from um, inking to coloring, everything, there is something about this book. This reminds me of what I liked about The Blackest Night Batman issue, which I thought was so gorgeous as well. And these, I gotta tell you, these tie ins have had some incredible art because mm-hmm. um, this one and the Wonder, I love the Wonder Woman. Oh, one. God, that Nicholas Wonder Scott, Woman is which just amazing. We'll, we'll, end up, we'll end up talking about that one coming up. But. <laughs> Wonder Woman one had one of my favorite lines in it is when the unknown so- soldier is coming out of the tomb yeah. and he says, I have a name, I just can't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> And I just was, bravo, Mr. Rucka. That was right there. Am I the only one in reading this uh, JSA issue as we were kind of going through it? That I read it through the first time, then I went back and read the introductions of each of these three characters in order. Like, I read all of the ones for Sandman. Yes. All the ones for Dr. Midnight and all the ones for Mr. Terrific. Right. Yeah. Because I did read them the way that it's, it's laid out initially. But um, yeah, second read through, I went through and I just did the Sandman's, then just did the Midnight's, and then Mister Terrific. Yeah, I did that as well, and it's actually a a cool way to read them. I always loved the original Doctor Midnight. There was something about that character that because I always liked the Batman style characters. So I remember with the old JLA JSA crossovers, that was my first appearance from him. You never that was the one thing with a lot of those. Not there were a lot of characters that made appearances. There were a lot of characters that wound up in action sequences, but that weren't heavily explored. That was a character who I always wanted to see more of. But I, in a lot of my reading experience, I didn't get a handle on Dr. Midnight, but I always liked him. I always thought that the costume was interesting. I thought there was something very, very cool about it. It is funny how, how much of it today reminds me of Red Robin and that style of outfit. You know, a lot of that can be taken from uh, Doctor Midnight's yeah. original costume, and it's kind—it's kind of cool. Well, and here's the thing: I once again, this is another—I had never read any. Well, I the Wesley Dodds, but only from his appearance in Starman. Really, mm-hmm. did I know who he was and a couple of the other Starmans, a couple of the other Sandman stuff, but very limited. But I had none on the Mister Terrific or the original Doctor Midnight. So that for me, I was like just reading these little bits here. I'm like. Oh, okay. This is, this is kind of cool. I'm wondering, and it's got me actually wondering, you know, about you know picking up story and just reading about these people and actually because I've seen the the blips of it. I'm like, I'd kind of like to see the actual fleshing out of it. 
I like that we learn in this issue that the Black Lanterns are able to think. Mm. I think I think we've always well, had we've, that. Yeah. We've had that hint of that, but I mean, they're not just using the memories, you know, to try and initiate emotion. They're able to utilize them ag- against the heroes. They're able to formulate plans, and that was an interesting part of all this thing. And, and ter- you know, terrific kind of realizes it later. But I, I thought that was something that to me was kind of a standout of this issue. And I think it's been something that I've liked about the minis all along is that we've gotten clues from these. And I mean, otherwise, what are the purpose of these issues? When, when these minis to me are, what is going to be the reaction of the various teams to people coming back? How is it going to affect them? What is going to be unique about seeing how the JSA deal with their dead returning to perhaps seeing the Bat universe or the Superman universe? Or, you know, how, how are these reactions going to be different? Because the relationships between these characters were very different. And that was kind of the interesting thing. I love that this one was all at least for the initial parts of the issue, was all told from the perspective of Black Lanterns. Like, we see the visual spectrum when we see present day. Yeah. It's all coming from Black Lanterns. We don't actually see it from the JSA perspective until we get to the double-page spread where it says Rise. That's when we get to see them back in full color again. Everything else is the memories of the Black Lanterns straight on through. And I kind of like that. It was just kind of a different visual look. This was a very pretty book. Uh Mm-hmm. This um, what I I really like this whole uh, memory download complete thing they've been doing. Oh, definitely, yeah. It's you know, so so basically, like the Black Lantern ring is just basically an evil iPod. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of an upgrade from an iPod Touch, though. Right. Because <laughs> I tried doing this. And <laughs> it's the iPod you don't want to touch. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> or you don't want to touch you. <laughs> well, you know what? I One thing I like about the memory download segments are it accounts for the fact that there's you're trying to appeal to longtime fans. But at the same time, there is a new audience base who's very into this series you know, the Green Lantern universe right now is branched out. These are selling extremely well, which means you've got a large audience that has never read these characters before. Sure. So you've got to bring them on board. They've got to know who these characters are. And it's a quick few pages that I find cool, you know, as a longtime reader. But it also gives something to, like Jim, you were mentioning, you don't know these characters. Yeah. So it's giving, bringing you up to speed real quickly on who they are. Or giving you enough where you can say, okay, if I, if I want to get further information, like you said, that's when you go to the internet, Wikipedia, and stuff like that. As comic fans nowadays, yeah. it's so great that we have access to being able to look things up. Yeah, Wiki's the greatest in the world, and so is Google. Just do a you know, quick search and whatnot. There's a lot of fan sites, though. I want yeah. to shout it. Actually, on our forum, Codis was kind enough to give me, there's a Hawkman blog that he found. It's an exclusive Hawkman blog. <laughs> there's a lot of fan sites out there, not just Wikipedia. There's a lot of fan sites out there that are dedicated and devoted to specific characters, specific universes. And it's not just DC. It's, you know, Marvel, Independence, stuff like that. The Internet is a rich source of information for comic book fans, of people who just love this stuff, who are putting out encyclopedias of information on websites that you can just dig through. It's very cool. And comic Book DB is a good one. Oh, Comic Book DB is brilliant. Yeah. Comic yeah. Book DB is fantastic if you're looking for, like, if you get into a creator or if you get into a character, looking up appearances. I have gone there so many times to look for creators and try to find out work that they've done. And, you know, so I've got, because a lot of times you get into somebody new and you see them. Like, for example, this one, I love Eddie Barrows on this one. If I wanted to find more Eddie Barrows work, I would go to Comic Book DB first because, the, and that's all fan produced. Right, right. You know, where people will log in and uh, the amount of fan support to that site. And that's one, too, if you're into supporting fan-produced projects and you love being a part of that, Comic Book DB, for anybody who's listening to this one, sign in, get an account, and be a part of that. There are, they, it's so comprehensive, but they're always looking to fill in certain areas where you might have some knowledge on a favorite series of yours. And that's the great thing. You can adopt and be a part of a favorite series of yours, putting on synopsis, putting on you know character links. and It's really a cool site. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because it's something through... Um, Comic Geek Speak was a big one when that first kicked off. With, right, right. Uh, doing rally cries and things like that. And I've always loved Comic Book DB. 
it's like what I use it for too is I look up they have an awesome little feature called Story Arc. Mm-hmm. So you can actually look up like say the Death and Return of Superman. It will tell you every single issue. If you want to go to a convention and say you, you want to go fifty cent bin diving or dollar bin diving or something, I mean it's absolutely perfect because I, I plan on getting like a lot of my uh, comics uh, binded, but there's certain issues I'm missing, and I'm like, well, what, what did it have to do with this story arc? And then I just go on Comic Book DB, boom, boom, bing, and there it is. Oh man. You know? <laughs> You know how many times I've sat there, I'm at my computer going through the different thing. Now this is okay. This is part six, and I'm I'm tr- I'm. Just Have you gonna, been to comicbookdb.com? Well, I've been to comicbookdb, but I didn't know they had this story arc thing. And the beauty. Oh is- yeah, yeah. It's right there. It's oh, right under man. creators and characters and everything. Sure. The other thing I would recommend for people: a lot of times, people when they go to comicbookdb.com, they don't create their own account. Do yourself a favor and do that. There are a lot of features available to people with their own accounts to. You know, save and customize information to your own account. Um, you can actually catalog all your comic books right there too, if you like to. Um, there's a lot of uh, great tools that are there, and and they're open to suggestions as well. So you know, they're you know, be a, feel free to be an active part of the comic book DB. But create your own account. Do yourself a favor because there are a, a ton of tools that I, c- I couldn't even do justice here at the moment. But browse around that site. There's a ton going on there. It's a very cool site. Yeah, I'm one of those people who've never created an account. I just go there, you know, when I'm looking for, like, the same thing with, you know, looking up creators and stuff like that, seeing what they've done, what work they've done, that kind of thing. So I don't have an account, and maybe I should. No, you should. It's, it's honestly, there's a lot of features that are available. Not that they're hiding them. They're ones that you would want linked specifically to you. They're customizable. So, yep. you know, it's, it's definitely something where it's worth making your own account and seeing the kind of cool little things you can do with that site um they've really it's made by fans for fans so it's created by the ground up you know it's it's actually created by fans from the ground up to be a useful tool for fans and it's just it's a cool site it really is a cool site and and it's been interesting to watch its growth you know because i remember what it was like when day one when it came out because it was something like i throw out comic geek speak I, i was listening to comic geek speak brian deemer and peter rios and the guys were talking about comic book db and just how this is a very cool project and things like that i remember what it was like in its uh, foundations and to see that now i'm like oh my god it's you know it's so incredibly cool it was cool in the start but now it's like it's a mind-blowing Whoa. resource yeah. yeah and and another cool thing too jim is if you do the story arc thing it all not only tell you every issue it tells you every character that was in it it also tell you if there's a trade paperback so you won't have to look for the single issues if you want to go that route. And there's also a link where you could find those issues on eBay. Nice. Just like that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, when we're done recording today, I'm going home and creating an account there. Because <laughs> you, it's funny because, you know, there have been multiple stuff. Like with when I'm going back issue hunting... You know, for, like, Detective and for Batman, for Superman, for action, I'm... I know I'm not going to go all the way back, but I'm picking to a certain story arc where I'm going, to, I'm going to go back this far. And as the years have gone on, I keep saying, "Well, I'm going to go one more story arc back, one more." And it's I kind of move things back and shifting it around because at first it was one year later, and then it was like, "Oh, now I'll go a little bit beyond that." And it was you know, so I'm now going back a couple you know uh, arcs and whatnot through the uh, through the different titles, but. I was trying to figure where my starting point was going to be, and I was going through the different, you know, um, online sites where I was getting back issues from, figuring out, okay, this is that, and and I was just trying to find, and this would have made things so much easier on me. (laughs) (laughs) I use the program Comic Base to catalog my software. I mean, to catalog my software, catalog my comics, and it's funny. I use more than one resource because I love Comic Book DB. I use Comic Base. Um... Comic Base is a free version now, which is kind of cool for people who you know don't want to do the pay. I do the pay version, but I mean, if you want to like play around with it, there's a free version to play around with that actually you can catalog all your comics with as well, which is kind of a nice thing. But they have a link. They have a um, thing called Atomic Avenue, which you don't have to have Comic Base to use. But Atomic Avenue is people who use Comic Base can sell their comics there by individual issue, which is very cool if you're looking for those hard to. And I honestly have had an intense amount of luck. Um, finding singles there. Cool. And, uh, really? 
Yeah, it's it's really so. It's another one. Atomic. It's um, comicbase.com is the site for the program. I, I believe Ato- I, I don't remember the actual website for Atomic Avenue because I usually go through there, but I'll put it in the show notes. But I mean, you do a, a, a Google search for Atomic Avenue, it'll pop up. But that is there. It's for users of Comic Base where they sell them. But you can buy issues from there. I believe you can put things up for sale if you don't have Comic Base. I don't sell a lot of my singles. You know, if I sell things, I'll like sell them in runs because I bought trades and things like that. So I don't usually use it for sale purposes. I, I could easily just sell my singles through there too, though, if I wanted to. But it is one of those sites where it's very cool for me to like find books because I just did just recently the Talisman, which isn't a DC book, but it's uh, Stephen King and Peter Straub. I I didn't realize because I've been uh, getting all of Stephen King's stuff through Marvel that they've been doing. It was one of those because it wasn't being published. It was done by Delray Comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't catch it when it came out. So they have zero, one, and 2 out. And one of my coworker buddies, I always grab him the comics. I make it like his Christmas present or his birthday present, depending on which. So the Talisman was one I was going to grab for him. It makes it kind of an easy shopping. I just get all of the issues for him as they come out. And that's kind of what I put in the card. You know, I'm going to grab the issues for you, so don't worry about that. Because he doesn't go to the shops. So I'm like, that's kind of an easy shopping for me. I'm going to grab them for me anyway. I missed this. I went to Atomic Avenue and got them all. So, and I, it was cool because I got the alternate covers on a couple of them. And I liked the alternate cover better on a couple of the issues. So I got the alternate covers for myself. I got him the regular covers because he doesn't, you know, he just wants to read the story. He doesn't care. But I was like, visually, the covers look cool. So I, I but I, what I, what I actually might be nice and I'll let him pick which cover he wants. <laughs> Go <from> there. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a big maybe. <laughs> but I, that's a site that's, it's something that I've had a lot of, there's a lot around the internet. And I encourage people, actually, anybody who's listening to this, uh, feel free on our forums or through audio comments to shout out resources that you use, that you found useful. I think, you know, it's, there's so much on the net. Um, the Hawkman site that I mentioned, that's why I threw out Codis's name. I, I, I was like, wow, this is mind-blowingly cool that uh, it's there because I'm a Hawkman geek. I love Hawkman. Big shock. But um, it was cool to find that there was a fan blog out there. And it's, I mean, they just published something as of December 30th. So, I mean, this is an up-to-date blog. I'm like, I'm very into this, so I... I jump to it and i'm following it now hey well what was the december blog though yeah it's still dead (laughs) (laughs) no it goes through the it goes through the history of hawkman okay um you know by by the way jim by the way jim uh so superman (laughs) superman's not dead yes he is did did you did you not see what happened with him he's a black lantern now Uh, but he's still he's alive though in the world of krypton (laughs) <laughs> when does that take place in relation to this, though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's not hey, dead, hey, man. And just for the record, Bruce Wayne is alive. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Super- and not only Super- is he alive, he's living more than one life. <laughs> <laughs> He's Super, more alive than anybody in the DCU. <laughs> Superman is is a Black Lantern, but has a much better skin condition than Hawkman. We'll just leave it at that way right now. How's that sound? <laughs> hey, if you've reincarnated that many times too, you're going to need a whole bunch of oil of Olay. Yeah, yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is funny. I'm, I'm curious to see at the end of all this. Obviously, I think. A lot of the characters, not a lot of the characters, I think all of the characters in issue five who turned are coming back. Um, I think that's a no-brainer. Yeah. But um, I am curious about which of these Black Lanterns, if any of them. I don't think those are going to be the only ones. I think we're going to get some of the Black Lanterns back. So I don't know. I'm curious to see. It's kind of fun. But going back to this one, <laughs> we got on a tangent there with the uh, resources and all that. This double-page spread... Of the whole team. The rise. Yeah, I love that oh, there's yeah. so much action going on here. And I love that it's I love that this is the whole team together. We see Mr. America, we see Magog, we see our man and his wife fighting together. It's uh, it's great to see, you know, Cyclone and Stargirl. And I love Stargirl and Lightning working together, using their powers and seeing how effective that would be in that particular moment. But nobody understands quite yet what's going on. And I love that we're seeing this team, they have to deal with it in a different way. They, they have a different way of operating. So they're, doing, they're operating the way the JSA would. 
you know, you've got Mr. Terrific right now behind the scenes trying to get a handle on what is going on and trying to come up with a strategic plan to deal with what's going on here. And that has been one of the fun things for me with some of the minis has been to see how each team would deal with this threat and that it's not the same for each team. The way the Batman universe handled it versus the way the Superman family handled it was very different than how this team is handling it. And I like that. That It's got to be, show me some distinction. How, do this, how does the JSA operate? For, how the Justice League is handling it is very different. <laughs> There's a and this two page spread. They even have like a lot of the Golden Age villains popping up here too. Yes, I see. Uh, is that uh, Baron Blitzkrieg? Yes, who's choking Magog. Very much so. Yes. Go go go, Baron! And then there's the original Cavalier <laughs> up there, mm-hmm. which I was like, "Wow, there's a reference, huh?" Yeah, he's got a floating. <laughs> he's right beside Cyclone, kind of floating back there. <laughs> yeah, she's blasting him back. That's kind of cool. I love watching the new Wildcat knocking the head off over there, too. Or, <laughs> or part of the head. Part of the head off, yeah. Slicing and, through things. And, and, and I like how Dr. Dr. Midnight has, a, has a, a Black Lantern owl. Yeah, that was kind of cool. You know, <laughs> definitely a little, a freaky little owl there. And... We see them taking hearts, too, from... And I think that's something that's interesting. They're taking hearts from normal people, which we don't always see in every offering. But right. why wouldn't they? The idea for them it's is free obviously power. it's quick. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It's grabbing as much power as you can from as emo- <laughs> much emotion as you can pull. And I love the 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 winner of the unlucky lotto. You know, the one uh, bus driver that's standing right there, going, "Oh, oh God, he's still <laughs> alive and not for long, dude." <laughs> <laughs> wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> I like I like the look on his face. Like if I'm really quiet, maybe they won't notice. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the funny part, too, is you would normally think in a zombie movie, from any horror movie experience you'd have, it's the quieter you are, the safer you are. That doesn't help in this case. It's the emotion you're giving off. By the very fact that he has that look on his face, he's dead because of the fact that he's giving off fear. Right. That's what's interesting about the distinction of this. Normal zombie movie rules do not apply here. It's all in you. the, the people that are... Uh, able to control their emotions completely and almost be dead emotionally would have your best chance. So uh, that, that's really kind of a fun part of this whole thing is just kind of the distinction. It may, I think it makes it scarier. Sure. Yeah, it, it's one of the, you know, with the zombie movies, because this, you know, I, well, I, with the zombie movies, I always think, you know, I could survive that. I could actually probably do it. Now, when we get to the 28 days and 28 weeks and 28 years later zombies, those, I'm like, no. <laughs> Because those are like super zombies on steroids that can run down a car, you know. But you know the, the typical classic zombies. I'm like, I can outrun them. I hop on a bike, you know. I can outdo them, you know. And is this? I've read the you know the Max Brooks series. I know you know I got some survival techniques down. This is a whole other game. Well, I saw you in the 28 prequel. 28 seconds later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's about how long I passed against those guys. Yeah, it was really quick. It was a YouTube video. (laughs) (laughs) But this is a completely whole new ballgame. It's a whole new different story. And it's weird because part of me doesn't like saying zombie stories because this goes beyond the zombie. This goes beyond the slasher. This goes beyond horror. This is... It's... Yeah, I want to say just general horror story because it's got elements of everything. You know, that all the classic horror stories, the slasher stuff, some from zombie stuff, just some from action adventures that have really nasty villains in it. It has all this beautiful mix in it, and it's not just the 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 the, the main story arc, it's all these side stories have those same elements to it. So it's something that this as an event is just absolutely outstanding, and I just love it. I love how it's, like... I love how, like, in some cases, like with this, they did a JSA miniseries for this. Uh, in other cases, like in Rebels, for example, like that, it actually was in Rebels. It's, it's been an interesting balance from this. I, I was I was worried about it getting too big, but I love how, like, you don't really need to read this to understand yeah, Blackest right. Night. But yet, it's fun to... F- like, I'm with you, Jim. I'm geeking out at the global feel of all this. Like, it just feels bigger because you can read like a JSA and know that like this is affecting this team and you get to see emotionally how it's affecting them. But if you didn't read this, you could still read Blackest Night and get the picture. And just by even knowing that this series was published, you know that this has taken place all over the DC universe. Yeah. 
So I, I think it does lead kind of a... Um, it does give you kind of the feel that... Because like I'm, I just read the second part of the Doom Patrol um, this week, which I was getting caught up on some of my books I got behind on. I read the second part of that. And it was, it's just a great example of where you don't need to read that again, but if you do read it, it, it gives you this big picture that, yeah, the Doom Patrol is a part of this, and this team's a part of this. And because it's happening worldwide... It's not exclusive to like it happening in New York or happening in yes. Gotham City or happening in Metropolis or, you know, it's it's. Well, I mean, global. even even in the case of Rebels, it shows that this event is universe wide. Bingo, yeah, and Oa, it's happening on, and uh, you know, other planets, and it's that it's that's kind of the cool thing about this, just knowing that it's happening everywhere and everybody has to deal with it on some level. Well, I get a very original Crisis vibe off of this event. Yeah. Yeah. Where it, it's the entire gal- galaxy, in a sense, and you don't know what's going to happen. And there's going to be changes because of it. This this event is going to matter, and whether we see people come back or we see people go, because we don't know permanently what's going to stick. After We don't know whose deaths that we've seen so far are going to stick at the end of this. There's and, a question mark in all that. But I all, I think we're going to have some deaths that stick. I think we're also going to have some characters return. And barring any of that, there's going to be some lasting changes that come out of this. And that's what an event does. It shakes things up to what's just as interesting as not what's going on now, but what is going to come after this? What is it going to change in the universe? What relationships are going to change from this? Right. And and the thing I like it, too, is how, like the original crisis, anybody could die at any time. There's nobody safe here. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And I like also the fact that Johns puts out false information about this series on his on his on his blog and stuff like that. So when you pick and you're like, hey, that's not what he said was gonna happen. You know, it keeps you guessing. You yeah. don't know what's gonna happen issue to issue. Well the worst one of the worst thing, and it's funny is I'm saying this, we do a spoiler show, but one of the worst things is you know, to find out the very ending ending of some stuff sometimes. You know, it's, you know, I, we laugh when, you know, with um, the conventions. Before even the first issue of Blackest Night came out, people were asking him, how's it going to end? And they're like, why are you asking this now? It's, there's, we haven't even started a thing, but those, the people who are throwing out the question, well, is so-and-so going to die? Is so-and-so going to come back? Is this going to happen? They're like, hello, oh, it hasn't even started yet. So it is it is kind of funny that... There's, there's a difference, though, when you say talk about a spoiler show. There's a difference between talking about things that have been released and letting people know that, like, hey, we're going to spoil yeah. this because we're going to go chat about that, and, like, knowing what's going to happen six months from now. I don't want to know what's going to happen right. six months from now. I want to read it. Then I want to talk about it. <laughs> Exactly. It, it was kind of like the uh, what was it? The Batman panel in, in in New York. Yes. Yeah. You know how long's he how he how long's he dead for? Who said he's dead? Okay. Well, how long's he going to be gone for? You know. <laughs> and what was it? Greg Rucka said. Well, why don't I just tell you how it ends? Yeah. And right? I'm, a, <laughs> you know? I'm, a, I'm a huge Bruce Wayne fan. I love Bruce. I mean, and I, I'm adamant about. I want to see Bruce back under the cowl, but. I don't need to know how that all plays out. I'm enjoying the ride right now. I mean, that's what a, I'm saying. It's a ride. It's yeah. fun. You know. You know. It's. I mean, nobody's. Nobody really believes Bruce isn't coming back. I don't think anybody ever truly believed that like this was going to be permanent like this. But it, it's more fun to see how you get there. Yeah. Well, hey, man, it's you know, life's a dance. You learn as you go. Sometimes you lead. Sometimes you follow. And yes, that's another song. <laughs> I had to have a song reference in here, so I had to figure out a way I can throw it in. <laughs> wow, I, thought, I was just going to say that was very zen of you. Uh, Thank you. Your other singing's going in, too, so I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were going to keep that in or not. Oh, I, I recorded all that, because it, it, <laughs> it just wouldn't stop. So Misery Loves Company. Oh, okay. That's the new show ending for this week. <laughs> I'm seven. serious. It's a super Are we show. Include I, I do. I want, a, I want a greatest hit CD. <laughs> I, I've got a blank one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I've I'm never right. sounded any better. Here you yeah. go. <laughs> blank CD. And, and here's the beauty of it is you can put anything on it you want. <laughs> <laughs> or use it as a coaster because you never have to put it in the player. <laughs> <laughs> I liked Liberty Bell with Damage. Yeah. Because so much of John's run was focused on 
her and Rick's relationship with damage, especially her, they, they built a relationship there, really helping him to become more of a member of the team because he was so bitter at the beginning and slowly began to soften as it went out. That would be a re- friendship and a relationship that developed over time where she feels a responsibility. There. I, I don't want to say motherly, but it's that kind of relationship where it's I'm responsible for this person. I helped encourage them to stay on the team. I loved her focus on that. Um, she was a pivotal factor in changing who he was and making him feel better about himself. This is a guy who had a relationship, you know, and became the kind of person who could develop one and became more secure in himself even though he was so horribly scarred. And that was the interesting part. And she was one of the reasons why... I mean, we saw this guy, look with the Magog arc, where he got his face back, and he ultimately had to choose. Yeah. And I, I mean, just such a rich history with this guy and her having to deal with the fact that he's gone now. now I, I have no doubt in my mind he's coming back. He's, well, he has to. Because, yeah. I mean, see, that's the thing that, like I was saying, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Because he, he is actively in All-Stars right now. But where, okay. does that, where does that take place in relation to this? We don't know that. Yeah, yet. we don't know it, where. It exactly. Yeah. And that's what I think is beautiful. Because it's just great storytelling. Because this could be before or after the split. Because in, sure. this, in this type of situation, the split's irrelevant. Yeah. You would rally everybody you could together, allies together from anywhere. And who would be the first team that the JSA would call? All-Stars. The All-Stars, because yeah. yeah. they're, they're people. You know, Get in here, let's work together on this. So I don't necessarily know that this has to take place before or after the split. I think we'll find out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this is kind of cool. And, and I also like the fact that you know, Liberty uh, Liberty Bell feels like this is all her fault. You know, like if she didn't convince him to come back, he wouldn't be dead right now or one of these things right now. And right then and there, there's her husband. Get that idea out of your head. That's not your fault. And Alan. Alan kind of jumping in a little bit later and saying, Grant's gone, Jesse. The darkness got him. Right. And Jay checking up in there. How are you kids holding up? Th- those two in particular, because they've seen so much death, I think they're, they're two of the more compassionate heroes in the DC Universe. Where in the sense that, you know, they care about feelings and emotions, but they also care about the survival. And then say, at this point in time, we cannot deal with this. We have to give Mr. Terrific time. We have to deal with this situation. We have to stop this. Then I guarantee you, these would be the first two people checking on them emotionally. You know, saying, let's sit down, let's talk about it, I'm here for you, you right. know, doing the father figure thing. I think they would both be right there doing that. Wildcat would do that, too. A lot of times he comes off as, you know, kind of a cold fish, but then you've, we've seen him so many times where he emotionally will drop that and, you know, becomes that kind of father figure as well, that mentor figure, which you don't expect from him, and, and that's kind of a cool thing. So it's, it's, that's one of the things that I really loved about this moment, because this shows veterans right there. Um, you got to stay right where you're at. We can't go anywhere. You can't go look for Grant. We've got to get... We gave these bodies to Mr. Terrific. He needs to study these because we need to find a way to stop this because this is an overwhelming amount of numbers. And as a squad, choosing which heroes are on the battlefield and which ones aren't and why. Yeah, it's a tough call. You mm-hmm. know, And you got to feel for the people who are in the lab right now because... Mm-hmm. They know the, the action's going on out there, and they know, man, it'd be a good spot for me to be in. But, it, of course, it makes sense where the, who they have there and why they have them. So it's, again, a really cool team concept and good usage of everybody as they should be. You know what? I want to give applause to Robinson on this one, and, and actually to Willingham and Sturgis on this one. JSA, JSA All-Stars in this book, these all feel like the same characters. Yeah, it is very cohesive. Like I don't feel like yeah I don't feel like this Power Girl is any and and honestly let's go to um, Palmiotti and Gray and Power Girl these are characters who are appearing in multiple places and Giffen and Magog these are I characters love who, that series yeah man. oh Power Girl is so fun but yet even though that series because that series is lighter it's more fun I still feel it's the same person and I love that. Like, I don't, you can have fun with a character and yet not lose her, yeah, what she's like on her team book or this, like this person who's crying here with this deep, angry emotion, I, I could still plug her into that book. Yeah. And that's, that, that to me is, that's hard to do. And it's applause to the writing teams that are involved with this character because she's being written in three different places right now, actually, for us to count that she was written by Willingham in uh, JSA and wow. 
Um, this this is a deep moment, though, because I would be... Could you imagine this, seeing somebody you were so close to? There was a little error here. I don't know who made this mistake. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, my uncle was dead. Was yeah, actually I her caught cousin that, too. In that one frame? Because she talks about him as her cousin in the previous sequences, and that was one... Just a little... A tiny little nitpick that I caught. But, oh, okay. Uh, I ended up catching that we made, all of a sudden you jumped from being her cousin to her uncle, and he is her cousin, not her uncle. Right. Because she she was basically the Supergirl of Earth Two back in right. the eighties, the early eighties. And and she actually refers to him as her cousin in the first part. Wildcat and Rao's name. That's my cousin. How can you talk about him like? And I liked that Wildcat because he tends to have diarrhea of the mouth sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, what we all up. have, right? Oh, absolutely. I've said, so, <laughs> I've said so many dumb things in my life. But th- that was the great thing about it because I've been here before. I've done this where you, you don't mean to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't mean to be insensitive. You're looking at one thing and you're not thinking about them because you're not them. And, and he even admits, I don't have some, you know, she goes, show some. And he goes, class, I'm at your feet, darling. You're so right and I'm so sorry. And that dialogue, the way it's written, the tone, it feels like the boxer. You know, he's a little rougher around the edges and yet he's a pussycat. You know, yeah. right? I mean, that's. That was an AEO kind of Rocky moment. I love thing. him, though, yeah. about that. Rocky's yeah. a great example of that because there's those moments where Rocky Balboa has those things yeah. with Adrian where you're just like, you know, he's a soft hearted guy. You know, at his core, you kind of get that there, and that's that's those are the parts where you connect with him. That's where you connect with Wildcat, right in those moments. And I love. I would read a Wildcat solo series in an instant. I loved him in Classified when they gave him solo issues. I would love to read a Wildcat solo series. I think he'd be incredibly interesting to read. That's he's a man's man. I mean, for guys, this would be yeah. an action. I mean, I would I could rally behind him. <laughs> Well, and I, I like this whole this whole series of events art wise. The facial expressions, absolutely, from the, from the top panel of this page all the way to the bottom, the facial expressions are just, I mean, like wow. <laughs> Artwork in general in comics right now, I'm I'm thrilled with because I love the diversity, you know, of different artists and things like that. I mean, it really is. I'm seeing a whole bunch of art that's just kind of making me excited. Yes. Because nothing's cookie cutter out there right now. It's all interesting. I, I think it's all pretty. You know, we've got some really good looking art right now with very different takes. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. You're... <laughs> well, just going through like the facial expressions, that final panel where she's like, they're going to be sorry. They're going to be sorry. And oh, you yeah. see that the, the tears streaking down her face, but she's still got that, I'm about to hurt somebody look. I just, I hooped and hollered at that one because I was like, Oh yeah, we're gonna get some serious butt kicking going on. I just, I thought that was just a really just bam kind of moment. And she's a little rougher than Superman, you know, in her approach to situations. She's definitely more of a heavy hitter than Superman. I don't mean that like she's more powerful than. I don't mean it that way. I just mean her approach to things. Clark, uh, Clark doesn't get like that very often, where he's in that position. Where I, I don't see Clark seeing saying that line. Right. Unless it's an extreme situation, in this case with her, it's very fitting of Power Girl. It's I, I mean that more I guess in a personality sense versus a power sense, and I like that distinction. I'm glad that it's it's something that makes her a unique character, and well, you, can, you can have multiple it's, Kryptonians. It's, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. It's, um, it's also the 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 fact too is like, you know, how many years after Crisis. They didn't have an origin story for her. She didn't even know where she came from. And then she found out over the last, what, couple of years. And now here's the last remnants of her past, of her home, of her family. You know, I mean, like, that's just, that's got to mess with you. And there's, you know? an, there's an Earth 2 she's found out, but right. it's not her Earth 2. Yeah, she thought her. it was. She yeah. thought she went home. And yep. she realized that she didn't, that that home does not exist anymore. There is another Earth 2 out there with people who are uh, very, they're almost mirror images. Of her Earth 2, but it's right. not her Earth. Because the, Earth ref- because the multiverse reformed, um, it's rebuilt itself on the concept that she was not a part of that Earth. And I think that's so, interesting. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That messed with me because at first I was like, "Oh, okay, everything's back to when I first started reading." Co- nope, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so that that is interesting that she is, I think, the only surviving person of her er, of her universe. Right? Yeah, because yeah, I don't think there's anybody else who got out of there because it was really her, 
Superman and Lois. Right. And yeah. that was it from their world. Yeah, because like out of that whole little Alexander Luthor was from Earth the old Earth three and Superboy was from Superboy Prime. And that does fit yeah. Infinite Crisis, because Alexander Luthor recreated the multiverse. He created so it's a brand new multiverse. Right. So that's fun. It does make your see. I've always liked that though. You know, people always say that that makes your head hurt. It does. Yes, but, but it's fun. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it's something unique about the DC universe. I like that. I like that you got to wrap your head around the yeah. fact that there's alternate realities, and I mean, that's alternate realities are something that's exclusive to the DC universe. You know, that's you know, Star Trek explored like mirror mirror universe and stuff like that. I mean, that's always something that I've always found as interesting. But I love that idea that. A different choice, a different action would create a whole different world. A character heading down a completely different path, they could get married on one world and be alone forever on a different world. And that's and that would change everything because they would have kids on one world. Those kids wouldn't exist on the other. Huntress is a great example of, yeah. you know, I love that uh, he was his, the Huntress was the daughter initially and that, that we do have a Huntress now on our world, which I thought was cool. Magog seeing here. I like see when Magog gets into a fight, that's where I do like him. Like in these moments, he does look powerful. And you know, he's energy based, light based, which we know does have an effect on, you know, the Black Lantern. So he's gonna be a good tool in the fight. It's not only just throw down, you know, you need somebody who's gonna throw down, hit hard, hit fast, and move on to the next target, and who won't be slowed down by emotions. Magog is one of those great warriors. Only problem is, he's probably, when you look at him, he's probably pure will. You know, so he could be at a point of, you know, a full color, you know, full spectrum build where they may want to harvest his heart. Do they ever show a Black Lantern looking at him in the color scheme? I don't remember seeing one. I don't either. I'm looking through here. Because it would be kind of interesting because his powers are we got two more issues. From a, a god, you know what I mean? Yeah. And plus, he's very cold and calculating, so yeah. he, he seems like the kind of guy who could shut off emotion at the you know a heartbeat. See, if I, he knew to. Yeah, I would right. say he's probably will and rage are the, probably the two things, but I don't think he's got a lot of rage in him because to him, this is a mission. This is a task at hand. So he's focused at task at hand. Because he doesn't have, doesn't have an emotional He doesn't have an emotional connection to these people. So it's, you know, this is pure, this is, you know, just his duty. Although know? he might rage at the injustice of it all. He might, his yeah. So there might be injustice. some rage. We've, there seen might be some do, rage. we've seen him do that yeah. in his book. So I don't, I, we got two more issues. I'm sure we'll, I'm hoping we'll see that at some point. I love this dialogue bit with Jay when he's come speeding in to the hospital room. We need a miracle, people. And just sure comes back with, <laughs> I don't believe in them, which goes back to his own religious convictions. We've seen this throughout him. He doesn't, you know, have a religious belief. He believes in science. I don't believe in them, Jay. Light. I need to create a light energy of our own. Something that... And he's going through, Jay, I need Green Lantern, Lightning, and Stargo. Bring them in. And Dr. Fate. If we're going to win, we have to find Kent Nelson. So he's, like, coming up with a solution to this whole thing. Yeah, he's starting to come up with a weapon for it. And, that's and, awesome. and he has different resources to pull from. And he, I love that we're seeing here that Alan Scott's light is different. So he's going to have to come up with a whole different way to work through this than everything before, and they've got characters with light powers yeah. and magic and bring him in. I want to see what he's going to do. I'm like so into this. I'm like, I don't know what he's going to do. Well, see, this, this line here that he says, if we're going to win, we have to find Kent Nelson, mm -hmm. who's Dr. Fate, and the original Dr. Fate was an agent of order, just like Dove was. Ah. The original Dove. See, that's why I'm telling you, it's... It, I, I said this from when I first saw what happened with with the Dove and then how Don Hall couldn't have been raised. Because Hawk was Hawk and Dove, one was an agent of chaos, one was an agent of light. Mm -hmm. And they had no problem with the agents of chaos, but they couldn't raise Don Hall. And now they can't really touch the new Dove that's out there now. So I, I have a feeling that Dr. Fate and Dove are going to be very key. Well, I mean, we already see that Dove is very key, but I have a feeling Dr. Fate is going to be, whether he knows it or not, which will be interesting because he is such a new character getting used to his powers. Well, but that's something, though, where... And, and when Jay brought him in, Jay made mention of that. He just said, you know, we have a rich history with Kent Nelson. And mm -hmm. one of the things we're here to do is to help young heroes 
you know, learn about their powers and get, you know, that's something where we can bring to the, they can bring that experience to the table with him. This is going to be an interesting show of, I think, growth for Dr. Fate. And also uh, maybe helpful for us to understand, is this one still an agent of order? Um, right. Can, you know, can he drum it up on his loan? Or maybe he's going to be, you know, a piece of that puzzle. I don't know. I'm curious to see how this is going to work. I love seeing Johnny Quick here, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's just that's all that's all kinds of awesome right there. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and poor Jesse, talk, I, talk about somebody who emotionally at this point probably the least able to control emotions is going to be Jesse because she's already feeling so much emotional guilt to damage. Now yeah, Dan's yeah, back. Yeah, she's yeah. a rainbow over here. Look at her. Yeah, yeah. Fair well, hope, love. There's will there. I do like that in all the heroes so far we've seen, there's been at least a thread of fear in there. You know, these aren't, you know, these are normal people, so there is going to be a bit of fear in it. But there's always, when you see the fear, you always see the will right along with it. You know, so it's, they have the fear, but they have the will to overcome the fear. And that's why they're heroes, and that's why they act. And I noticed that they showed the younger characters, the new Wildcat, Lightning... Yeah. Um, well, I guess that's Star Girl. She's been around for a while, but and Cyclone. Those are the ones they really showed. Well, you figure probably if you're a Black Lantern, you're going to go after the younger ones. They probably will be a little bit easier targets, and maybe you could either manipulate them a little bit more, go after them, and well, that kind of stuff. I am thinking though, this is more the JSA's decision than the Black Lanterns. I think the Black Lanterns came after the JSA in general. And I think the JSA pulled people off the battlefield. Like, I'm guessing the veterans brought the bodies to Terrific to analyze. Yeah. So the mm-hmm. reason why Wildcat and Power Girl are in there, Power Girl, obviously her connection to Black Lantern Superman would bring him there. And just Wildcat, you know, helping out with the body as well. I, I just, I think they have the veterans in there at the moment because I don't think that's, I don't think that's a choice thing of the Lanterns as much as theirs. Because we do see various veterans popping in and out of the battle you know, for the purpose of, you know, Psycho Pirate being in there and things like that. I don't know. Yeah, it was I just, Superman brought them. Right. But I for would... Mr. Terrific. I would guess that if he would have, when he brought them in, the veterans would be there analyzing it. You know, so you've got Power Girl with her... Rela- obviously, Power Girl would want to see this because there's an emotional relationship there. This His body has been desecrated now. Mm. I know if it was my cousin, I would certainly be in there. Yeah. And then... Wildcat, I'm guessing, just because of history. You know, I mean, this he's a veteran. Let's get your two cents worth. He's more of a leadership role. I guarantee you we're going to see him battling it out at some point, though. <laughs> it is interesting, though, we see Stargirl, Cyclone, and Lightning back in there. It's like, Cyclone's back in there now, which that wasn't one of the ones called in by Terrific. So I think they are swapping people in and out of the battle. Well, you figure with her power, she could actually kind of keep them away at yeah. bay yeah. for a little while anyway, you know, while they're trying to figure out what to do. And just because, like, she's in the panel that you go back to uh, the page where Liberty Bell's all freaked out about damage, and you see Cyclone's got like two or three Black Lanterns in this big old Cyclone <laughs> just ripping them apart. So, yeah, Lo- Lois coming to look for her yeah, husband. Her husband. That was awesome. I, I know mean, that voice. Yeah, that was just a cool <laughs> thing. When I saw that, I was like. Who's and it, I completely forgot that Lois was still around and that they didn't stop her in the Superman stuff. So her coming over, that was just a cool moment. And nobody else would hear that because it was a yeah. distance away. That's why Wildcat was asking what's wrong, and she's already there. And there's Ma Hinkle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ma. And the, I, now Adam Sma- I was glad to see Adam Smasher in this. Yeah. Because he's somebody that I haven't we haven't really seen much at all. And to see him here with damage and see what that's going to be like, I'm wondering... He's he's another one that right now I'm wondering if he's going to survive this. Adam Smasher? Yeah, because you know what? They brought him in towards the end of, of the JSA arc where they split, and now he's not on either team. Mm-hmm. So, you know, are we just reading too much into that, or is, is he cannon fodder? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that he's cannon fodder. There could be a reason that he hasn't been on screen, but we'll see. Because he's certainly not on either of the team, but then again, neither is Sand, and Sand is very uh, yeah, Sand doesn't, Sand doesn't seem to be on either team right now. Yet he's made an appearances right. in the book. Yeah. So th- I love the Doctor Fate helmet and appearance. Like when they come through this portal here in that big shot, yeah. there is oh, that's a, awesome. 
I love the full helmet. I mean, I've I've seen you know the the offerings where he's had like the half helmet that opens up his mouth, and you can kind of see that. And I, I know why visually they've done that in the past, but I always I grew my first exposure to Doctor Fate was with the full helmet, mm. and there's something it's there's something mystical and to a certain extent powerful about it because it's like he's faceless, emotionless, and it does add a kind of an enigma to him. Because exactly. of that appearance. I, I like it. I just it's something that to me is um I always thought the half helmet just made him too human. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, um and actually I think when he had the half helmet, didn't wasn't he more like Kent Nelson than he was in the boo? Well, I think I wonder if it, did point? he originally have the half helmet in the Golden Age? I have to wonder. I gotta go back and look and see. No, in the Golden Age he had looking back in the more fun comics, he had the full helmet. I was just, yeah, I was just looking back. So, but I also noticed the color of the portal they're coming out of. Oh, the white light. Yeah. yeah. See, that might just be a clue, or maybe I'm just reading into it, and that's what I love about this event. Yeah. No, yeah, you're right. Your agent of order thing, because I, I think you know what I think the question mark. Any other time, if it was a, if it was Hector Hall, for example, I'm wondering if the changing age of magic. We're going to learn right here. If the changing age of magic has affected the status of Doctor Fate and what he is, right? And I, I'm that to me is interesting. I could very easily go either way on that because the age has changed, not any other reason. And that to me is that's goes that's interesting as well. And I, you know, I'm really interested in this this one for the most part because it's a three issue miniseries, but mm-hmm. with the history this team has, you could easily make this six issues. Oh yeah. You know, this could have started at the beginning, you know, and just went right along. And it's just interesting because I want to know now who's because you got to figure a lot of these guys are not alive when they were heroes in the 40s. So, I mean, you really have an endless supply of people you can raise and give them evil iPods and send them on their way. (laughs) (laughs) It is funny. There's there's so many more stories you could do with Blackest Night that we aren't going to see because, you know, there comes a point where they've got to stop. Sure. Like Blackest yeah. Night, Uncle Sam, and the Freedom Fighters. I here's the funny part, though. I am so into this. Yeah. I I would keep, you know. I mean, okay, I'm in. You know, because I like Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters. I know that oh, would be dude, interesting. So, hey, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, who would be the good guy still alive though? Uncle Sam. Well, the current Uncle, the current Freedom, the freedom Fighters, fighters. The current yeah, Freedom yeah, Fighters versus them. the past Freedom Fighters, which we they've already made those. The past Freedom Fighters have made appearances, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. With well, with damage in in the uh, graveyard. Yeah, because yeah. the human bomb was there, and I think one of the because there was like three Phantom Ladies, right, going yeah. from All Star Squadron history all the way up to now, right? Yeah, that a pastor. So I mean, that was like one of the what was it? Was it Infinite Crisis where they all got? Yeah, killed, yeah, like right infinite. in the beginning. Yeah, they got that. Uh, <laughs> that grabbed my attention right away. I was like, "Really? <laughs> wow!" <laughs> you know? Well, it was bizarre. That was, to show the, it was, that was to show the society and how yeah. powerful they really were. Bizarro beating the one to death. You know, oh, pretty lights, pretty lights, no lights. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the society together. Yeah. They overran them, is what it was. Yeah. Did, did have you read the uh, Blackest Night tie into Superman, Batman? Yes. Yeah. With Bizarro, yeah. Solomon Grundy, and Man Bat. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Three of my favorites right there. I mean, and really, you don't even have to read that if you're enjoying the you know Blackest Night event itself. It really has very little to do with it, but I just thought it was awesome to see Bizarro throw Solomon Grundy into his son. Yeah. See, I, like his son. I, like- <laughs> I actually applaud that. I love that they've, they've made these little like tie-in things and things like that, something that if you're having fun with the event and you want to grab something, you can and just enjoy it as an isolated story in the Blackest Night world, in the Blackest it, Night event. But exactly. you don't have to. Yeah. Because, I mean, me, I'm, you know, I'm like a sponge. I want to read all of it. But not everybody can. And, you, you know, to, to force that, where you have to read, if you didn't read this, you're going to miss out. You know, it's, it's, yep. this, is, this is a great way to do an event where you're being conscious that your readers are all in very different places. Those of us that can't afford to do it and want to, we can read as much of it as we want. And there's a time factor, and everybody has the time to be able to read all of it either. So, you know, you're really kind of making an event where everybody can be a part of it, can be talking about Blackest Night and theorizing about the whole concept of it 
without having to read every little detail. This for us, you know, we're into this because we're JSA fans, and I, I want to see how this is affecting them and how this team deals with it. I love knowing that Dr. Fate right here, he in Vegas, he, he met Black Lantern and Dr. Fate, and through this discussion, Terrific realizes that, oh my gosh, the original Mr. Terrific is going to figure out what I'm doing here. We need to right now lock down the lab because he's coming. Yeah, and then right. you know, Green Lantern. No, according to my ring, he's already here. I'm yes, like, oh, awesome, nice. <laughs> yeah, and just a cool ending and a, to a very beautiful book. Oh, it was fantastic. It was it was it was a great first issue, and 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 one fantastic cliffhanger. Yeah, this was a this is one of those great endings that really has me looking forward to the next issue because one, I want to see what Michael comes up with. He's going to come up with a really cool weapon. Mm-hmm. You know, against the Black Lanterns, you got faith in you know in uh, Mister Terrific there. But two, I want to see them dealing with their you know the legacies of their past. You know, set, having them go one on one with someone who's as smart and who can think and has the you know, similar power sets and whatnot. So that should be a cool fight scene. Plus, we got all the stuff going on in the battlefield with Liberty Bell with damage with her father. Our man's going to jump into that mix. Who knows who else? You know, Magog is probably going to get some pretty cool throwdown moments. So, yeah. Well, the, ori- the original Liberty Bell is dead, too, isn't she? Yeah, the mom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, really, she's feeling bad about damage. Now Dad is talking to her. She could turn around the next issue, and there's Mom. Yeah. It's cool. I love, I love Robinson writing the Golden Age characters, because that was... Some of my major exposure to him. I actually, I my history with him goes back to his firearm work at Malibu. I loved that series, <laughs> and and he, I just started. I followed him straight on through from firearm to leave it to chance to over to Starman and just I, he just everything he seems to write. I'm enjoying, and having him back on these characters is like coming home because it's yeah. uh, it's just great to read him on this. And I do applaud. <laughs> the writers who are currently writing these characters because this felt very much like it, it's in tune with the current series that are out and what's going on with them. I, nothing feels jarringly different. And these are characters like, I, like I'm like i with you. I want to read the next two issues of it because I care about the JSA and see I care about seeing how this affects them and how they're going to ultimately deal with it. We're going to get some clues. I agree with you, Donnie. I think we're going to get some clues on Dr. Fate and maybe he has a bigger role in Blackest Night than we realize. And I like that. I like the fact that these minis have felt like they've given us some clues. They've made us think a little bit more about things that are happening in Blackest Night. But I like that, it does, you know, this. I can read this. I don't have to read this in any particular order. Yep. Like, I don't have to feel like this is part four of Blackest Night, and I need to read this part in order to understand issue six of Blackest Night. I like that I can just read these in whatever order I want to based on my interest in the particular story. So, like, this was one because it was JSA. I read it pretty quickly when it came out, and especially because it was Robinson writing JSA yeah. again. I was geeking out at that. But <laughs> you, anybody can have a difference of opinion. You know, as far as they can read, you know, if they Superman Batman was a great example of that because I believe they came out the same week. The second part yeah. of Superman, yeah. Batman, yeah. People who were more into seeing what happened with Bizarro and Solomon Grundy could have read that first. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's that's the way it should be. Well, I also like the fact the way he wrote it was it's a continuation of Super, Blackest Night Superman, but it's not a continuation of Blackest Night Superman. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like for us who have read Blackest Night Superman, we're like, cool, this is what happens afterwards with these characters. You know, the Golden Age Superman and Lois Lane and Psycho Pirate. But if you didn't read it, there's there's a one line right there. It says, uh, Michael needs more time for the you know, to examine the bodies as Superman dropped off. Right. And if you want it if you want to check it out, go. If not, you know, it's just you, I, I just like right off the building. Yeah. 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 And that's honestly any it's it's a tough place to be in as any writer. You have to be aware that when you're kicking off a number one issue, you've got to be aware of the fans that have been. And the fans that haven't been. Right. And that's, it's, uh, it's good writing. It's a good way to handle it. Donnie, um, tell our listeners about Reality Wasted. Well, Reality Wasted is a podcast that I have with uh, fellow stand-up comedians Gregory B. Dubno and Dave Sheehan. And uh, we talk about pop culture, what's on TV, uh, movies, mostly geeky kind of stuff like, uh, you know, that 
pertains to the world of comics, but not necessarily. You know, every once in a while we do talk about comics here and there, and um, you know, we it give you the latest news on, say, the Iron Man two movie and things of that that effect. And uh, the episode we have coming out now is going to be the Wasties. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which is going to be, our opinion, the best in uh, television, the movies, and video games. Very cool. cool. Of 2009. Very cool. And, and there was honestly, and, for all of those things, there's a lot. There's uh, a good year. There's, there's a, a lot. Yeah, it was year. a very good year for all of that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the thing of it is, too, is we're going to show up at uh, Greg's house without telling each other what we've. So basically, it's going to be. Probably an hour and a half ago, and you're crazy. This was better because, you know, that's basically what you're going to get. So, <laughs> well, those are some fun. Those are some fun discussions when you don't know what the other's going to say. Because mm-hmm. you know, one, you're you're got to improvise off, you know, just off the fly. But two, it is you have your idea. You've been thinking about it, so you're going to get passionate. You're going to get defensive of your position. So, do you guys find yourself on the phone or on the internet or whatever, <laughs> like avoiding? discussions with each other because we do this all the time when we know we're going to talk about something on the show we'll start right. to talk about it and they're like wait we can't talk about that i don't want to know what you think don't tell me what you think don't give me any clues to what you think because <laughs> well, you basically be what we do is we will say okay well you know what do you want to do this episode right after we record we'll say okay what do you want to do next week and then okay and we'll talk to each other here and there but Basically, we don't, you know, like I don't tell Dave, oh, well, don't worry about the Iron Man 2 news. I got it. No. You know, we just, we go and, and unbelievably enough, we all come up with different stuff for some reason. Well, you know, I don't know. Because you're different people. I mean, that's that's kind of right. natural. Like, I mean, there's times where Jim will come here and he'll have a completely different focus on something that I have. Even when we know what we're going to talk about. You know, he'll bring up things that I were totally under my radar, and vice versa. Yeah. And that's that's kind of that's the fun about um, having different people on a podcast and different personalities and all that. So, and uh, I also do another podcast with um, Sean Pryor from PKD Media mm-hmm. called the uh, PKD Black Box, and I'm on that usually like uh, two or three times a month. And we just uh, you want to talk about tangents. We, we've done three episodes together so far, and I think we've actually talked for ten minutes about the topic we said we were going to talk about. Outstanding. And the rest of it goes from, well, I remember when he showed up on Welcome Back, Carter, and it had nothing to do with anything else. So that is a lot of fun. And so you could get that off of uh, pkdmedia.com or okay. iTunes. I'll definitely link that into the show notes as well. I, I've met Sean Pryor multiple times. I had the the longest conversation I had with him was just recently at the Mid Ohio Con. He is such a nice guy. And I encourage Isn't he? Yeah, if if you go to a convention and, and Sean Pryor's there, do yourself a favor and stop by and say hello. Uh talk to him about his work. Uh, it's really fun because he's a guy he'll sell you on the work that he's doing just because it's so interesting to chat with him. You'll yeah. you'll end up grabbing, you know, some of his books just because he's cool. I mean he's a cool guy fun to talk to um i actually i have i bought a couple extra copies of his trades to use as uh when we do contests periodically because i've got a bank of uh materials that i put up there and i, I picked like some of his mercury in the murder and stuff like that and uh he's just a, he's just a he's just a phenomenal cool. guy i just uh, you can't help but like him and he and he loves what he's doing and you could tell yeah and that makes you want to support him all the more when people have the passion, you just want to you just want to support them, you know. Well, I want to thank you, Donnie, for not only just for joining us for this, but just you've been such a wonderful friend of the show, and uh, I love when you call in because it always gives us some some interesting discussion points because it's always it's always fun to get your perspective on things. This is long overdue though, and I'm glad that we finally got a chance to do this. Well, thank you for having me. I had a terrific time, and. Uh, I'd love to do it again sometime. Oh, d- definitely. Count, definitely count on it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely do it again. This, this was is fun. fun. <laughs> to the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. You're ready to move up. Uh. 
Jim, it's funny. We're recording this opening and closing after the fact. We already recorded the episodes last week. I've been like stumbling through the opening and closing. Probably the longest it's taken us to do an opening and closing yeah. ever in show <laughs> history. And you actually put out a blue lantern ring. I didn't realize that because you said partway through we were doing this. And they, listeners won't hear this. But you're like, Sean, all will be well. So I, I'm like, okay. Oh, Okay, thanks, pal, and all that stuff. I didn't realize what you were actually doing, that you actually had put on a blue ring to kind of give me support. It worked, though. It which worked. Which is kind of the crazy part of the whole thing. It actually did help me to get through that. Well, I guess as well as I could. <laughs> Our sponsors for this episode are DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Justice Society of America, number 37. Regularly $2.99, 40% off, only $1.79. Our in-stock trades rage of the month for January. Towards the end of the month, it was chosen by Kent Hare. JLA Avengers, the trade paperback. The once-in-a-lifetime crossover that brought two super teams together and rocked the comics world is at last available in trade paperback. Own the entire four-issue co-publishing between DC and Marvel, which was written by Kurt Busiek, with stunning art by George Perez. This collection also features introductions by Original Avengers writer-editor Stan Lee and Justice League of America editor Julia Schwartz. 208 pages, regularly $19.99, 47% off, only $10.59. Thank you, InStockTrades.com, for supporting us with that great discount, and DCBService.com for supporting us with those great pre-order deals. Jim, we will see everyone next week with Blackest Night, and either somewhere in between that episode or after that episode, we are also going to have our Raging Oscar show. We are finishing up and finalizing our notes, and then Jim and I are going to be recording that like midweek in between episodes. So depending on when we get that finished, it'll be and it'll be up on the website when it's finally done, and we'll post that. But I want to talk about all the great releases and things that happened in 2009. There's a lot of trends and creators that I want to honor. It's hard because I thought 2009 was an incredible year. There was a lot of books that I really enjoyed. Our focus is going to be on the DC universe, but I did throw in a few things from um, outside the DC universe just to have that category in there but that is obviously most of our focus because that tends to be our show focus as well it was i don't know if you had the same problem i did though i had a really hard time pinning down a lot of the categories no i just half you know i just you know kind of uh, slacked it so it was easy <laughs> i didn't mean that you slacked <laughs> it i just had i just had yeah, um, I, I found as i was making up categories for the things that i really wanted to talk about from the year that i did have time uh, trouble pinning down who was like first second third because i i actually in every category i have it broken down in that kind of order it was hard to do this year because i think it was a banner year for just yes wonderful talent yeah so. this was a this was a definitely a just a great year to be a pot be a you know podcaster but also a great year to be a comic book fan yeah it was it was actually a, a just a <laughs> it was it was a hard year money wise because of how much good material there is it would yeah. be easier if it was material that we didn't like but there was so you know because then you could trim things down easily where you could sit there and go Oh well, this is enough. But I, I was I found myself having to stop myself from buying comics, not just DC across the board, you know, because I'm like I've got to stop somewhere, and it was very hard to do because I think there's a lot of quality all around comics right now, and I'm just I'm like having a tough time when I'm looking through every month and making my order, making decisions about comics, which is it's a great place to be in because I'd rather have the problem be there's too many good books than I'm trimming down because the books I'm reading are stinky. So. <laughs> So it's, I think that's the whole point of the episode. We do welcome listener submissions still. Have we gotten? Have you gotten any emails from them? No, I have not. Okay. So if there's anything, because I, I didn't get any voicemails from that as well, which is fine. I mean, it can be just you and me. But if anybody wants to get their thoughts on that episode, there's still time. So if you send those in, we will get them on that recording. So please consider doing that. That's ragingbullets at gmail.com or sensei of whatnot gmail.com. I'll take some of them as well. And you can always do it on our voicemail line as well. Your own thoughts about books you're enjoying and things like that. I'd love to discuss those because we're going to obviously discuss our own decisions. So I'd love to have some listener participation as well. And if we don't, that's fine. It'll be kind of fun to just discuss it. Anyways, we will see you all next week with Blackest Night. All will be well. Bye. <laughs> chatting how to check our levels so go ahead jim can we say, talk okay yeah, you, yada, yada, yada. please please do yeah. okay <laughs> uh, hey here we go uh okay say hi to donnie yeah. hello yeah. donnie how yeah. you doing? <laughs> sean, it's funny because when we're not like in the groove i'm sitting there just quietly going doo, 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 and like sean needs me to talk now so he mm -hmm. can test the levels and i'm quiet so i don't know it's <laughs> we'll sing him a song jim oh we got a request 
See, he's recording all this, so I don't know if I want to re- sing a song because you know. This is one of those rare times where I want you to. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> I never know when I can use it later. Yeah. <laughs> to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe. I was, I really was kidding. I know. <laughs> and that's the first song that popped yeah. in my head. You know, like, what the heck? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I really wasn't thinking that you needed to yeah. sing. Though, you know, it's funny, the song that's been going through my head a lot mm-hmm. has been from, um, you know, the Wells Fargo song. Mm-hmm. Oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the track. Oh, please let it be for me. There may be something for someone who's of no relation, but there could be something special for me. I've got that going through my head. Every time I see a commercial... Oh, it's going through my head now, too. (laughs) Every time I see a a commercial for Wells Fargo Bank, that song pops in my head. Mm -hmm. It's constant, and that commercials are constantly running. And when I'm at work, I'm right. Wells Fargo Bank is a big bank, so I'm constantly running into that when I'm doing my stuff. I'm like, ah, it's, you know... Jim, I need to hear Donnie, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you're singing and everything, and I've got your... You're fine. <laughs> now I can shut up. Yeah. Translation. <laughs> Donnie, how are you? Good. Should I do something for Music Man, too? Or no, I, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, well, I... Hey, if you know, hop in, man. Yeah. <laughs> Shapoopy, Shapoopy, the girl that's hard to get. That's it, so... Gotta be honest, I actually kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I only know that because of Family Guy. Remember when he scored the touchdown? Absolutely. Yes. 